Good morning, everybody. We are here. The Rajasthan chapter of uh, International Society of Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery. Uh, we are organizing this webinar on the basics of SICS along with International Society of Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery and Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society. Uh, before we begin with the scientific session, can I request uh, Dr. L.K. Nepalia to please welcome you all and give a brief introduction. Dr. Nepalia, please. Am I there on the screen? Yes, you are very much there on the screen, sir. Okay, dear. Uh, dear friends, it's a great pleasure for me as president of Rajasthan chapter of this organization to welcome you one and all to this wonderful scientific piece. Audio, audio, please. Audio. Uh, Dr. Nepalia, sir, you need to unmute yourself. We cannot hear you right now. Dr. Nepalia, sir. Unmute. Not able to get right. Tell, tell him to unmute. Um. Yeah, done. So, so uh, we require to hold such webinars where we can interact on uh, SICS. I hope it will be of immense uh, usefulness for the youngsters, for those who are ready to learn the art of SICS, and for even for those who have already uh, mastered it. Because we have some national and international reputation awards today amongst us to share their uh, views. So once again, I welcome you all on behalf of all the executive members of Rajasthan chapter of this organization, and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, Dr. Arun. Thank you, Dr. Nepalia, very much for this brief introduction. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, the executives from International Society of Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery, Dr. Amulya Sahu is here, Dr. Ravindra, Dr. Dhaliwal I here. Uh, can I request Dr. Amulya Sahu to please uh, speak about two words about the International Society of Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery? Arun, thank you very much. And I've been watching you and your How interest in SICS. Hmm? Nice to video? see you in virtual no, no, maybe. Hello. Yes, sir. yes, sir. Some background noise is coming. Well, ISMSICS, as you all know, is a now an international body with uh, chapters all over India in every state and plus about 15 countries abroad. So, as we are telling you, to be a master, you must master FECO and SICS. SICS is the art of cataract surgery. Before FECO, there have been wonderful surgeons and there will be always wonderful surgeons who can sew magic with their hands. So the younger generation must understand that machine is fine, but your skill should also develop so that people don't come for the machine. They come for you as a, because you are a good surgeon and you know everything. So that is where they should not think that I am a FECO surgeon. That means you are a part surgeon. You are not a full surgeon. So if you are a good surgeon, you tell them not to bother about you. You have come to the best place and I will give you the best results. And let not the patient decide what you have to do for them. You decide, you guarantee them the good eyesight. That will be enough for them. Because we are not confident, we are always talking about this machine and that machine. That is why you are not important, the machine becomes important. So a time has come to change that thing. And uh, Rajasthan, uh, uh, I want it to be in the forefront of this movement. As you know that last time, uh, I think uh, 21st, I, I, I installed that uh, Telangana chapter. And they had made 400 members. I thought the Madhya Pradesh 225 will be a landmark. But uh, Telangana immediately crossed it and they have met 400 members. So why this member, the membership is not, money is not an important factor for us, but this movement, it shows how it will go to the roots. The PG students must be involved. It is their generation, the coming generation, who are going to be global leaders. As you know that 
India is the powerhouse of SICS. Every other country, they sub submitted to the uh, market forces. But in India, somehow or other, they failed to control us because it is a hydra-headed country. Nobody knows which head to cut. So they failed. The last moment they tried also with the ministers and they tried to bring in the echo is the only uh, kind of surgery. But somehow or other, they find it is a very difficult country to control. So that is a blessing for all of us. We, we, we are developing a very synthetic approach to cataract surgery. In the years to come, as you know, that uh, all our surgeons are very much regarded abroad. All, and now with this art going with them, they are going to be really world leaders. So with this, I just want uh, all, the, all the dignitaries here, please take interest and promote MSICS. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sahu, sir, for the brief introduction. And uh, before we proceed, I may I request Dr. R.K. Sharma, sir, the president of Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society, who has so graciously allowed us to be associated with them for this particular webinar, to speak uh, two words, and then we can go on to the scientific program. Thank you, Dr. Arun. And thanks to Dr. Nepalia, sir, and all the dignitaries of uh, ISM, SICS. Uh, I just have two points to say. Personally speaking, I am a great fan of SICS. I have known people, I mean, uh, around 25 years also back, uh, way back in 1995, I was doing my training with Rodinal Fellowship in US. And one of the lady uh, house surgeon came to India in 1995 they were doing 100% FACOs in that center at least. And she came to India to, and she went to Aravind <clears throat> to learn SICS. So the point is, even if you know FACO, I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon, I'm not doing many FACOs. Even if you know FACO, you should know SICS because your machine may go off sometimes. As Dr. Amulia sir rightly said, that you should not be dependent on machine. As I say that, we should not be dependent on vitrectomy and you should be you should know buckling also similarly even if you know FACO, you must know FACO also there's no doubt about it but still you should know sics also secondly uh, regarding this particular webinar where i see that most of the uh, pgs are doing the lecture so it is more of a, like a grand rounds i appreciate that that once i mean this encourages the younger generation and senior people like Dr. Nepalia Sahib, Dr. Sau, Dr. Ravindra, and Dr. Trehan, etc., they can guide these people to uh, improve upon themselves. Thank you very much. And wishing the webinar a very great success. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, R.K. Sharma, sir. Uh, before we proceed, let me tell you that we have very senior faculties with us as discussant. We have Dr. Jagatnath, uh, Jagannath Boramani. He'll be here for a few, uh, for some time. Dr. Parikshit Gokhte is here with us as a discussant. Dr. Bhattacharya Ji, Dr. Srinivas Joshi, Dr. Ravindran, Dr. Harshul Tak, and Dr. Dhaliwal are all here as discussant. You have any question in between, you can type in your question and we'll see your question here and we'll put up for discussion. In the end also, we have kept some time for uh, question and answers for to take care of your queries and everything. Uh, without wasting much time, let's go on to the first talk. Dr. Uh, Trehan, sir, please uh, introduce the speaker and the panelists for the first talk. Good morning, all. As you know, this very first topic of today, it is a basics of SICS. Basics, we are dealing with only removal of cataract, putting an IUL. Of course, we have to uh, keep in mind about corneal endothelium as well as posterior capsule. Little overview I just want to give about SICS. Most of the time what we hear that SICS is almost related with camp surgery. So I just want to say that is it is not any way a small incision. Although Sahusar did surgery with 2 mm, 
but generally we are doing 3 mm 4 mm 5 6 7 7 so it is not small i should differentiate between two type of sics one is camp sics and secondly what we are doing in our practice that is cics customized incision cataract surgery so this is the main difference just i want to highlight and today we will try ourselves best to give some pulse for your life especially is for pgs some of the points we generally we will share with masters along with us we will give some pulse although these are the ground level pulse and we are trying our level best to dig the ground and give some underground pulse also so first speaker will be dr bharti auja please share your screen dr bharti audible sir now now you are audible yeah uh, a very good afternoon to all uh, i would like to thank uh, international society of msic msics and rajasthan ophthalmological society and uh, uh, our departmental hod dr jayshree ma'am to give me this opportunity to talk on this uh, topic the topic is case selection and pre operative considerations in cataract surgery the purpose of doing uh, the pre operative assessment is we have to confirm and ensure the diagnosis of visually significant cataract to determine if there is any coexisting ocular pathology to assess and manage if there is any systemic problem and to ensure the patient's wish to undergo surgery and understanding of specific risk what are the goals we are going to achieve through this whole exercise obviously high success rate in terms of restored vision and improved quality of life we need to have minimal or low rate of complications and obviously the time consuming procedure the procedure should be less time consuming the surgeon should formulate a surgical plan before proceeding for cataract surgery he should formulate a plan including type of anesthesia what kind of iol and what power is going to implant regarding the site size of the incision and astigmatism reduction procedures if at all required and the surgical risk needs to be stratified based on the expected complexity of the surgery suppose in cases of small pupil pseudo exfoliation previous eye surgeries the pre operative assessment consists of ocular and systemic history ocular examination diagnostic procedures and laboratory investigations ocular history as obvious we are talking about cataract so the history should be noted as per visual symptoms blurring of vision colored halos some patients complain of uniocular diplopia glare difficulty night time vision and sometimes the patient can say about the loss of contrast sensitivity also if there is a nuclear cataract the diminution of vision will be more for distant as compared to near and the vice versa in not say vice versa but the diminution of vision is less for near and and distant both in cases of posterior subcapsular cataract duration progression should be noted history of previous intraocular diseases is very important uh, um, uh, importantly uveitis and keratitis sometimes the patient doesn't give any history but we have to elicit the history uh, by asking leading questions as if the patient is having any history of recurrent redness or if the patient was on long term treatment for any corneal ulcer or if any other uh, intraocular uh, disease history of previous intraocular surgery again is important 
if the patient has undergone any previous uh, intraocular surgery like glaucoma corneal transplant or any uh, any retinal detachment surgery other eye cataract surgery status also should be noted then the history of intraocular injuries is also important associated complaints of discharge and redness ocular examination for a postgraduate student should be done in a meticulous manner and should be done in a systematic manner also the first and foremost obviously the best corrected visual acuity for distant and near vision in cases of immature cataracts if there are if there is a case of hypermature or total cataract then plpr to be noted very accurately cover uncover test to have a uh, idea about uh, heterophoria and then there can be a, a, an idea about amblyopia also ocular adenexa looks very uh, simple but needs to be examined in detail starting from eyebrow eyelids eyelashes any discharge in cul-de-sac or any palpebral and uh, palpebral aperture whether the palpebral aperture is narrow or wide uh, especially in deep set eyes again ocular movements lacrimal sac and apparatus to is to uh, needs to be examined to rule out any decrocystitis conjunctiva for any congestion or any scarring simply from cornea uh, cornea should be noted as how much cornea is clear if there is any presence of scar whether there is any presence of corneal edema endothelial status can be uh, seen on slit lamp also if there is any presence of pigments or gutate changes on endothelium again the thickness corneal thickness needs to be uh, measured uh, with the help of papillometry and endothelial status can also be uh, uh, seen by specular microscopy topography also uh, important these days to assess uh, the corneal curvature anteriorly and posteriorly iris uh, iris to be noted down for atrophy or any other vessels on margin or any other uh, nvis ac depth contents should be noted pupil uh, dilatation and pupillary reactions are very important then lens position of lens whether the zonules are intact or not what is the grade of cataract the cataract is soft or small it it all all these things will have a influence on the incision size type of surgery incision uh, size shape size everything fundus uh, also needs to be assessed in detail retina optic disc scan macula with the help of b scan and oct and sometimes in cases of immature cataract where there is a potent uh, disproportionate visual loss potential acuity meter is also important to uh, determine potential visual function after cataract surgery investigations the minimal investigations includes blood pressure and blood sugar the uh, limits what we have set is 140 by 90 mm of mercury for blood pressure and blood sugars are fasting uh, less than 140 and post mandel blood sugars less than 180 biometry is obviously very important some syringing is optional uh, it it could be done or it could not be done but we we should have an assessment uh, regarding the lacrimal apparatus by roplas testing body weight is uh, for uh, titration of any drug dosages additional investigations in in high risk cases as per anesthetist or if the patient is very uh, elderly age group any uh, known cardiac cardiac ailment or illness ecg should be done biometry uh, biometry should be done uh, very meticulously always we should do keratometry first before doing any other corneal contact procedures or any tonometry uh, we have to measure the corneal curvature for both the eyes Uh, we need to remeasure it if the corneal curvature is less than 40 diopters or more than 47 diopters in either of the eye difference uh, in corneal cylinder if it is more than 1 diopters between the eye if the corneal cylinder is not correlating with the refractive cylinder again uh, the same applies for axial length of both eyes uh, through immersion a scan if the axial length measurement is less than 22 or more than 25 mm in either of the eye needs to be rechecked again remeasured the difference if the uh, between the two eyes is more than 0.3 mm and if the axial length measurement is not correlating with the status of refraction the like the hyperopes should have short eyes and myopes should have long eyes so it needs to be again and again rechecked i'll power formula uh, choice uh, lies like if the eyes are having short axial length less than 22 mm hopper q formula is uh, it's considered to be appropriate SRK2 is still considered for the axial lens of 22 to 24.5 mm and if the axial lens are high 
more than 26 mm srkt formula needs to be uh, applied pre operative counseling uh, again uh, needs to be uh, done very uh, needs to be done in a detailed manner to the patient about the surgical procedure about the type of anesthesia about the level of patient pain that the patient is going to experience during the surgery especially in our surgeries uh, after draping the patient uh, how the patient is going to feel that needs to be explained uh, pre operatively again the risk and benefit of cataract surgery for which we are doing the whole exercise including any risk specific to the patient if the patient is having any a hard lens or advanced cataract or the small pupil they need to uh, know prior to cataract surgery that what kind of risk and benefits they are they can have prefer refractive aim and the need for refractive balance between the two eyes and obviously explain the post operative follow up and schedule preparation of the patient before surgery uh, uh, patients needs to have uh, topical antimicrobial therapy uh, generally everybody uses broad spectrum fluoroquinolone four times a day three to four days before surgery uh, again there is a role of oral anti antibiotics which again is controversial depends on the operating surgeon it's uh, there is no harm if we give oral antibiotics prior to cataract surgery anti anxiety medications or tranquilizers to those patients who are very apprehensive or hypertensives oral acetazolamide uh, 3 hours before surgery it's generally indicated in those cases uh, which are going to have ecc surgery Conti uh, we should continue the systemic medications as per the base physician if the patient is uh, having some systemic comorbidity xylocan sensitivity test uh, sics is going if we are going to do in a block xylocan sensitivity is a must clipping of eyelashes again is a optional thing with the ad advent of uh, modern self adhering drapes nowadays uh, this thing is generally uh, what i feel is obsolete tropicamide uh, 1% along with phenylephrine 5% 5% eye drops is the standard uh, dilating drops which we are instilling three times uh, before surgery again uh, phenylephrine should not be given in children and hypertensive patients for the obvious reasons patients should be advised to have a light meal and face wash and full head bath prior to surgery now uh, patient selection in terms of uh, ocular specific history we should uh, see the patient if the patient is of angle closure or open angle glaucoma pre operatively iop should be recorded gonioscopy should be done if pre operatively gonioscopy uh, tells us about the closure of angles laser pi is a must before proceeding for cataract surgery to have a adequate pupillary dilatation during surgery again glaucoma associated with pseudo exfoliations uh, previous inflamed eyes where there are the issues with synechia endothelial status keratoconus eyes or previous corneal transplant undergone eyes corneal scars previous refractive surgeries previous strap previous rd surgeries or any surgery uh, where there is silicone oil filled in the eye these are few pictures which can tell us about these are not the good cases for a beginner like if, if we can see in the first picture the page the eye is showing prominent uh, corneal scar the other eye shows prominent uh, arca senilis so these both eyes again will have the issues uh, during surgery in terms of visibility visibility will be uh, not very good again the eyes uh, here the eyes are showing the status of corneal transplant done this eye showing uh, rk previously uh, radial keratotomy done in these eyes again these eyes are not good for beginners to start off the uh, issues lies with the visibility again the issues lies in the site of the incision and uh, what kind of incision they are going to put and where and then il power calculations because uh, these eyes have already al altered corneal curvature so il power calculation formulas will not be accurate glaucoma associated with pseudo exfoliation have issues with uh, weak zonules so ctr ring needs to be arranged prior to surgery fragile anterior capsules surgery needs to be done under a good uh, high molecular weight uh, viscoelastic so that the rexus should not escape uh, again staining of anterior capsule is important poor midriatic uh, eyes so pupillary dilatation again is a concern these are some of the eyes which are not a good cases for beginners like uh, the this eye shows colobomatous uh, iris 
this eyes these are the eyes uh, which are showing iris atrophy most probably herpetic and the complicated cataracts uh, in cases of uv aap karo na ya ha to main kar raha hu main to ya karo to the same issues uh, the presence of synechia we have to assess pre operatively because uh, during surgery we need to release all those adhesions to have a good pupillary dilatation and endothelial status needs to be assessed because endothelial endothelium most of the time is compromised in uh, these eyes so uh, again the we have to take care of endothelium obviously the depth of ac uh, if it is narrow the working space will be less for a beginner surgeon pupillary dilatation again posterior polar cataracts it's it's uh, no for a hydro dissection for uh, obvious pc dehiscence or sometimes the pc is very thin the risk of uh, posterior capsular rent is uh, more in these eyes zodular status to be uh, ascertained in these cases uh, where there is lens subluxation the uh, the eyes where there is a previous trap done or a presence of uh, bleb again the we have to uh, decide about the type of incision site of incision and these eyes generally are hypotonus so difficulty in tunnel dissection also in terms of medical history uh, age is a very important factor if the patient is very young the cataract will be very softer and uh, the adhesions uh, between capsule and cortex will be more so difficulty in nucleus prolapse again elderly pa elderly patients heart cataracts so incision should be larger systemic diseases uh, diabetes hypertension asthma cardiac artery disease renal failure and septic foci uh, these 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 conditions need to be taken care pre operatively there are certain drugs which can have an impact uh, uh, on cataract surgery of which which is important is systemic alpha blocker if the patient is on temsulosin we need to ascertain the history pre operatively this drug can uh, cause uh, intraoperative floppy iris syndrome uh, in this uh, uh, syndrome the iris is the, the there is certain alterations in the structure of the iris and iris has iris generally prolapses out of the incision and if the iris prolapses out of the incision the whole uh, su subsequent surgical steps are going to be difficult uh, other drugs of importance are antiplatelets and anticoagulants which need to be stopped prior to surgery so in those uh, patients there because there is a risk of bleeding so corneal incisions are preferred anti hypertensives again the long term steroids drug allergy to sulfonamides and any other antibiotic or any hypersensitivity reaction uh, we need to assess the patient's ab ability again to uh, lie reasonably flat during the surgery to cooperate for the surgical procedure if they have any issues like orthopnea kyphosis scoliosis bharti or, please conclude please any, conclude any coughing or breathing difficulty uh, uh, they need, that needs to be ascertained claustrophobic patients and uh, neuro, uh, the patients who are having neurological problems this is a list of all systemic disorders i am not going into details but uh, the uh, we have discussed more maximum of uh, these case these conditions then pre operative checklist needs uh, to be uh, there with a beginner uh, surgeon so that they can have a easy e easy identification of the case selection anesthesia again uh, a big no uh, for topical anesthesia for a beginner surgeon they they have they should do surgery under regional or local anesthesia and obviously we use peribulbar block which is the most common uh, uh, these days a uh, general anesthesia sometimes required where the uh, patient's medical condition is severe enough which is uh, limiting their acceptable positioning during surgery or pediatric cataract surgery or if there is any marked uncontrolled tremor or if the patient is disoriented or confused who are unable to comply with the instructions better to go for general anesthesia when uh, to postpone a case if on the day of surgery uh, in the morning of the surgery if the patient's sugar status is high or blood pressure is high patient is complaining of severe wheeze these are the systemic indications where we should postpone the case and if uh, there is dr. any complication Bharti, dr bharti sorry to interrupt you you need to conclude uh, because we are exceeding the time limits please conclude yeah yeah sure sir. so uh, i am i'm just uh, i just tell uh, i just want to tell you about the tips which i can extract from for the beginners the yes yes go on yeah. pre operative ocular examination of both eyes under mediastasis is very essential and it should be done by uh, it should be done by operating surgeon 
then pre operative counseling we have discussed that is very important to develop a rapport between a patient and a surgeon checklist then the the beginner surgeon should not operate initially on one eyed or young young age patients or high myopes traumatic cases posterior polar pseudo exfoliations shallow ac or where there is lens induced glaucoma or apprehensive patients painting and draping again is essential identification of the patient is very very important always pay, uh, a surgeon should check medical records of the patient already obviously for for obvious reasons name again i procedure prior to surgery they should repeatedly check it up and the anesthesia should be very good instrument trolley needs to be checked staining of anterior capsule in the beginning is very important i will power before insertion also needs to be checked again and again and uh, senior staff supervision or assistants will help them and obviously relaxation of the mind take home messages ideal case for a beginner will be a clear cornea with normal thickness healthy endothelium and normal anterior chamber depth well dilated pupil intact zonules immature cortical catheter of grade 2 to 3 nuclear sclerosis meticulous case selection and pre operative preparation obviously results in a good outcome biometry and correct ial calculation is a critical factor for good visual recovery thanks for your kind attention dr bharti hello yeah dr bharti you have not mentioned about hepat hepatitis b and uh, hiv testing yeah hiv testing um... you have not mentioned it yeah, yeah i have not mentioned but uh, hiv hba status should be ascertained pre operatively and also you have not met, mentioned about betadine in your cleaning procedure which is a must yes sir yeah <clears throat> and i now request uh, dr nawab ali and dr rakesh porwal sir and dr lakshman jhala to please add on to what dr bharti has already spoken how about uh, i have a question for bharti sir arun yeah i have a question for dr bharti Uh, yeah. What are the two absolute contraindication uh, where when you are selecting whether you want to go for SICS or FACO? What are the two absolute contraindication things where you will decide clearly that I will do only SICS and not FACO? Uh, One sir, is where FACO machine is not available. Hyper mature cataract, sir. No, 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 no. Absolutely, he is asking absolute contraindication. You are asking absolute contraindication for FACO, na? Hmm. Absolute contraindication for FACO, it it is, sir, hypermature cataracts or any. Uh... Hello. Yeah, yeah. Please go on. Doctor Rakesh Porwal, can you come up with your answer, please? Porwal, sir. <clears throat> Dr Ravindran sir you wanted to speak something uh, please unmute yourself first sir it's an excellent presentation very comprehensive and very useful what i would recommend is that uh, there are certain uh, nabh guidelines though you, you may not become a nabh member you cannot actually you may not but you can go through all the guidelines there and all these are followed up all the mentioned there then you can you can make a list of especially what i like was checklist that he mentioned this is the most important thing that youngsters often forget <laughs> even an assistant can put try to put drops to the left eye instead of the right eye uh, you know then the correct itself all these will have a, a you know shock to the patient's mind so this is very important as far as absolute contraindications anything where zonules are defective you know though the modern techniques are available where you can do a fake emulsification even in such cases or when the cataract is 4 plus 5 plus i would prefer to take the sics as the first thing rather than trying to uh, the uh, venture especially beginners with the fake emulsification the next thing is the small pupils and uh, she already mentioned the uh, pseudo exfoliation these are the things which we should always keep in mind and switch to the Uh, SICS. Yes, uh, Dr. Bharti. Yes. 
Uh, compliments for a wonderful presentation under the able guidance of uh, Professor uh, Jayashree Singh. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to comment something more in the present COVID-19 scenario regarding the counseling, consent and evaluation of the pre-operative evaluation of the patient? Sir, uh, due to this COVID-19... Um, because we have to change our approach. Yeah. The surgeries, uh, what we are doing uh, now for co uh, under this pandemic, uh, generally we follow the same protocol, except uh, more we are concerning for, uh, like we you, when we do the surgery, we used to uh, put PPEs. We used to have uh, COVID-19 uh, testing, RT-PCR we used to do in all our cataract patients preoperatively. Are you getting it done at your institution? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are get, getting it done. Here in, in Ajmer, here in Ajmer, JL and Medical College also, they have made it mandatory, a pre-operative COVID-19 test. And yes, I think sir. that's a, a logical approach in an institution, in a premier institution. And we are taking consent also for COVID-19 uh, situation uh, with the patient. We, we used to explain them about the pandemic. And we used to take a written consent also uh, in our case sheets. And then uh, we, we usually explain about all this uh, situation and uh, uh, sanitization and whatever we are doing generally that we are following the patient we are taking with the mask inside and uh, all other precautions what we are taking uh, the same as uh, we, we were doing previously. Sir. I would like to add something here. It's, it's possible in the institution to do an RT-PCR test, but it's not practical to do this in the private institution as a small time practitioners or the practitioners who are based at the periphery. Uh, Dr. Ravindan has come up with something very good, which we are following. We are putting the betadine drops diluted with CMC. Dr. Ravindra, if you can just explain us, how do you constitute those drops and what is the dosage of that those betadine drops 0.25% or 0.5% which you had recommended? Okay, the betadine is available commercially as 5% aqueous solution. You don't go in for betadine scrub, which has got alcohol in it. Uh, the lot of companies have started manufacturing them. And uh, the, uh, the best thing is, after you put a drop of proparacaine in the eye, you can put 5% betadine. There's no problem. Proparacaine, the tears that come out, and the betadine, betadine automatically gets diluted. The, uh, what you can do is, uh, you know, uh, we take a bottle of betadine, it comes in a plastic one, and then we uh, turn the cap onto it so that the hole is formed and uh, 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 and take a teardrop. Teardrops comes either in 5 ml or 10 ml. If you add 1 ml to 10 ml betadine, 10 ml of tears, 1 ml betadine into 10 ml of tears, it becomes 0.5%. Uh, you know, the betadine which you can use comfortably, they're very comfortable. So, what I do is uh, take the teardrops. And in the cap of the tears, add 1 ml or half ml, depending upon whether it's a 5 ml, 10 ml, 10 ml. And uh, remove the air from the, uh, the, uh, uh, the tear drop bottle, invert it, put it inside the cap, and suck it. So the bitterine goes into the bottle, and then it becomes uh, 0.25 or 0.5 percent aqueous solution of betadine and that you can directly put it you can dispense to the patients you know, preoperatively they can use it they're very comfortable the patients won't have any problem with them but what we have been finding uh, important what we have been doing is as uh, we all know that rt pcr as well as the antigen test have got a lot of false negatives so once the, we do a scanning on the uh, patient once we have done a scanning we give a break of one week at that time uh, we'll ask the patient to quarantine one week, presuming that in case he's infected already, he'll be symptomatic in one week's time. We post for surgery one week later. This is what we have been practicing uh, to safeguard ourselves from an infected patient walking around in the hospital and in the operation day. This has worked well for us. <clears throat> anything you'd like to add, uh, Tirhan, sir? Uh, about the preoperative assessment, anything about the keratometry or placing your uh, incision, Dr. Trian, sir. I think he's, uh, his screen is frozen. Dr. Dhaliwal, sir, would you like to comment on the preoperative keratometry and incision placement? Uh, regarding the keratometry, I would just like to add there are many times when the cornea is slightly scarred or not very clear, 
so we just add a drop of uh, uh, the any of these tier tier substitutes and then do the keratometry it makes things easier and uh, one thing varti had mentioned was corneal uh, xylocan sensitivity yes. i would uh, like to because i'm not from an institute i left that institute more than 35 years back we were always told ki save yourself from xylocan toxicity because we were doing peribulbar and retrobulbar injections were given sensitivity uh, never meant was never mentioned for that matter sensitivity to any drug that that will be used would matter thank you well, can i add one point here yeah please yeah see the uh, in olden times the one of the ways of checking penicillin sensitivity was put a drop of penicillin into the eye just like an intradermal test there will be acute congestion of the conjunctiva so we when we were doing it now i don't do xylocan sensitivity at all when we were doing it instead of saving one injection and procedure we would tell the patient that we are doing xylocan anesthesia test put a drop of it in the conjunctival sac anyway if patient is waiting there for dilatation whatever it is and there there is no reaction in the conjunctival sac in terms of chemosis redness watery then we would write down document that conjunctival and allergy test done and then it's negative and we'll tell the patient also so the patient is aware of it i've never seen xylocan reaction in my life related to the xylocan drug it's always related to your injection into the uh, you know into the vein into the one of the vessels opting yes. out sheet and uh, the the face the brain stem getting anesthetized having all that but as such to the drug xylocan i have never seen maybe there but i have not seen the drug allergies uh, and uh, uh, i would like to add one more just one sentence sir uh, bharati we have to aspire for the day when we will not be refusing any patient sics surgery you have to train for that yes sir uh, can i can, can i come in to Yeah, Arun. Please, sir, sir, please, please, Vitaal. Yeah, see uh, about the contraindications. I think endothelial count is a very important factor, and that so uh, and uh, deep uh, opacity, corneal opacity. I think it is uh, preferable to go for a SICS than uh, PECO because you can't see if it is opacity is covering about the pupillary area al almost half. It is always better to go with a SICS. It, it is said, sir, that you can manage all the cases with uh, with SICS, but you cannot manage all the cases with FICO. Absolutely true. Uh, let's yes. go to the next talk, uh, Dr. Nikhil Goel. He'll be talking about incision construction and placement. And uh, the panelists for this will be Dr. Kavita Bhatnagar, Dr. Vijay Gupta, and Dr. Gulam Ali. Dr. Uh, Nikhil, please share your screen. Yes, sir. Arun, as they are uh, starting, uh, I would like to comment two points here. Whenever you take the measurements, either on K reading or uh, you know ARK machine, whatever it is, yes. it's always mandatory for the patient to be closing the other eye with the hand and looking at the target. If the patient is not looking at the target, all your values are wrong. Number two is when you are doing the Roplast test, pressure on the uh, say zinc. Uh, many people press it, uh, you know, somewhere here. So uh, it's on the nose, nose, nose bridge, nose, nasal, uh, you know, bone. Yeah, but actually, let identify the anterior lacrimal crest. Take your soft of your finger behind the anterior lacrimal crest and press it directly. Then only, then only you'll be eliciting the response. Because milder form of chronic arthrosclerosis can be easily missed if you do not press the lacrimal sac area directly. And we should be aware that the medial canthal ligament is over the sac, so yeah. we need to press slightly hard so that the ligament presses onto the. Yes, you're right. One more point, Arun, if you permit. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, I would like to know from Dr. Sahu or Dr. Ravindran, are they using techniques like retroillumination sort of things in the cases where the uh, media is not clear and the corneal opacity is, as the speaker has mentioned. See the modern uh, uh, stereo coaxial. Uh, you know, Arun is an expert in microscopes. <laughs> stereo coaxial illumination has 
you know, made the surgery so easy. So the youngsters, if they want to buy a microscope or even if people would like to change it, specifically ask for stereo coaxial illuminated microscope and the, all these corneal opacities literally disappear with that, uh, you know, illumination. The second, if the corneal opacity is so bad, you can always take the help of endo illuminator, keep it very close to the limbus, uh, the corneal, uh, you know, very close to the limbus and you can even put a stick there or you can sometimes even take it in the anterior chamber and, uh, you know, illuminate. That will again uh, give fantastic illumination, fantastic visibility of the, uh, your, your uh, cataract. Thank you. Michael, please start. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to ISMS, IS, uh, ICS, uh, ROS, and the Department of Ophthalmology at RMT Medical College Udhapur for giving me this opportunity. I'll be giving a talk on incision placement and wound construction in SICS. Uh, so first of all, the first step after painting and draping a case uh, is uh, putting a rectus bridal suture. So the uh, purpose of this bridal suture is to maneuver the glue and it also provides a counter traction force during the nucleus extraction. So we use a double angulated forceps or the dastur rectus holding forceps for this. Uh, the angulated tip for this measures 7.7 .7 mm and which is uh, used to hold the uh, uh, grasp the superior rectus muscle. So what we do is we close the forceps, put the first angulated uh, part at the superior limbus at 12 o'clock and depress the uh, tooth part onto the sclera, uh, try, uh, keeping in mind that we have to hold the superiorus muscle through the conjunctiva with the help of the tooth part. And after holding the muscle, we move it from side to side to uh, gently, not too firmly, uh, to test whether we have held the muscle properly and make sure that the globe is moving according to that. After this, we pass a 4-0 silk suture underneath the um, uh, forceps. So this is a photo showing how we do it. Firstly, we grasp the superiorus muscle. Uh, after this, the suture is passed beneath the muscle, uh, keeping in mind that we have to pass the needle just beneath the uh, forceps, uh, from where we have held with the forceps. And after this, the globe is steadied by pulling and clamping the suture with the mosquito forceps. Uh, the complications that can happen with a brittle suture include globe perforation. So to avoid globe perforation, what we have to do is we have to pass the needle exactly under the area of the muscle grasp and also, we have to lift the muscle with the forceps while doing the uh, needle pass. Also, after initially entering the conjunctiva with the needle, we have to keep the needle plane either parallel to the sclera or upwards, and we have to keep in mind to take a small bite. Uh, the other uh, complications that can happen are bleeding, muscle, muscle injury or superiorus hematoma, and a failed brittle suture. After this, we have to perform a conjunctival peritomy, which is basically the op making an opening in the conjunctiva. So for this, we have to uh, use our non-dominant hand to hold a forceps, which is either a colibri or a P.S. Hoskin forceps. And in the dominant hand, we use the Westcott conjunctival scissors. The flap we do in SICS is based towards the fornix. Uh, the initial cut is given uh, vertically at 10 o'clock. Uh, so uh, we hold the uh, conjunctiva along with the tenons firmly and give a vertical traction. And in this vertical traction, we give a, a nick with the uh, conjunctival scissors. Uh, the uh, initial cut that is given, uh, we insert the scissors into that and we do a blunt dissection by opening and closing the blades without cutting. So this dissection, uh, this opens up uh, the space between the tenons and the sclera. And after we have done a blunt dissection sufficient, uh, we cut the conjunctiva along the limbus. So, this conjunctiva, after we cutting, uh, we cut at the limbus. We give, we get a peritomy. A uh, good peritomy is approximately eight mm in length and four mm in width. Uh, the, uh, uh, there are no islands of tenons uh, left anywhere. Sclera is clearly visible, and the conjunctival epithelium also uh, should not be overlying the incision area. The, you should also have a good exposure of the blue limbal zone in this. After this, we perform a cautery. So we use wet field bipolar cautery for this. Uh, a cautery allows us visualization of instrument uh, during the tunnel, uh, during creating the tunnel, and also minimizes the bleed into the anterior chamber, intra or post-operatively. Uh, we have to keep in mind that we have to do uh, just a judicious uh, scleral cautery, not too excessive, not too less, because excessive scleral cautery can cause scleral thinning or necrosis, and also leads to poor wound healing. So what we have to keep in mind, we have to 
apply point cautery exactly to scleral breeders and limbal uh, breeders have to be avoided uh, also uh, the tenons which is still attached to the sclera and not uh, separated uh, can be cauterized with this and cautery ideally should not be applied after scleral incision and making the tunnel uh, now coming to the scleroconeal incision and the tunnel so this is a self sealing incision uh, giving uh, with the help of a corneal wall uh, there are three components to it first is the external scleral incision second is the scleroconeal tunnel and third is the internal corneal incision so the external scleral incision can be given with a uh, surgical blade or a surgical knife or with a crescent knife also the scleroconeal tunnel is made with a crescent knife which is beveled up and the internal corneal incision is given with a keratome which is beveled down so firstly the external scleral incision uh, what we do in this is uh, we have to give the initial incision 1.5 to 2 mm posterior to the limbus uh, when we are giving the incision it has to be kept in mind that the blade has to be perpendicular to the sclera if we keep it at an angle to the it uh, there is a chance of wound gaping or sagging of the wound later uh, after this the length the length of the uh, incision has to be titrated according to the density of the lens nucleus uh, the uh, more harder the nucleus the larger the size uh, but it has to be at least 6 mm so that we can insert an iol easily uh, the instruments which are used for creating the incision the tunnel are the colibri forceps or the uh, crescent or the surgical knife so uh, this is a diagram representing the astigmatic funnel as described by coach so as we can see uh, there is a funnel uh, uh, which is uh, based at the superior limbus and any incision placed within this astigmatic funnel causes no astigmatic effect on the cornea as we can see for the diagram the closer you are to the limbus the smaller is the incision size so placing an incision slightly away from the limbus gives us a larger incision size with a lesser astigmatic effect uh, now coming to the shapes of the incision uh, the various shapes that can be used are smile incision straight incision frown chevron or an inverted batwing incision uh, uh, if we consider the point of wound stability and astigmatic effect the best incisions to place are either frown incision or a chevron incision uh, the incision depth has to be titrated the optimal depth is half to 3/4 of the scleral thickness if we are uh, less uh, uh, if we have make an incision thinner than this there is a chance of button holing or deroofing of the tunnel if we go deeper than this there is a chance of premature entry into the anterior chamber uh, also if we uh, give a too deep incision there is a chance of a ciliary prolapse or a uveal tissue prolapse and scleral disinsertion uh, so in the scleroconeal tunnel first what we have to do is we have to find the right plane so the uh, for see, making the right plane the incision depth has to be right and we have to make a groove in that with the crescent blade after this we have to uh, 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 continue the tunnel while maintaining the same plane and make it uh, wide enough and long enough uh, so uh, for this what we do is we do a uh, swiveling motion when we are going uh, anteriorly and a sweeping motion when we are going sideways so the blade when it moves uh, sideways it gives you a uniform wound uh, there are no ragged areas and there is no tissue cutting in between planes Uh, also when we are at the limbus what we have to do is we have to tilt the blade slightly anteriorly to match the increased curvature of the cornea so that the uh, depth of the plane remains the same in that uh, in the cornea also and after uh, entering into the uh, corneal planes we have to make the tunnel width uh, as much as we made into the sclera that amount has to be made into the cornea also after this once we have made a sufficient tunnel into the cornea we dip the uh, keratome blade and enter into the anterior chamber giving us the third plane for the incision so this gives a triplanar scleroconeal incision so uh, as we discussed we have to make sweeping movements so that the incision is smooth and non ragged the depth is also uniform the incision depth can be judged by looking at the blade through the sclera it has to appear translucent should not be either too clear which means it's superficial and should not be too opaque which means it's uh, deep and the anterior movement of the blade should be swiveling while the sideways movement is uh, sweeping uh, also when we are uh, doing the lateral swiping movements uh, the blade has to be tilted uh, also the globe can be tilted along with the counter traction force so that the plane remains the same and it does not go superficial or deep 
while going from side to side. If we go superficial uh, when going from side to side, that leads to a button holing or a deroofing of the tunnel. Uh, as we discussed, we extend the tunnel 1.5 millimeters into the clear cornea, and and using a bevel down, down keratome, uh, we go to the extent where we have ma uh, made the tunnel into the cornea, and uh, dip the blade downwards. This creates a dimple which gives us indication that the third plane is ready for entry and then we with a gentle force we enter into the anterior chamber after the anterior chamber is entered what we do is we keep the keratome parallel to the plane of the iris and extend the tunnel cutting only in the forward movements so when we are going forward you have to cut uh, coming uh, out we don't cut with the keratome so this is what your wound would look like at the end of the creation of the uh, sclerocardial tunnel the external wound would be somewhere around 6.5 mm. Uh, the scleral part of the tunnel is 1.5 mm. Uh, the corneal part is also same, which is 1.5 mm. But with the ex, uh, uh, side pockets and the extent into the uh, uh, cornea, the in, inner dip of the incision would be 7.5 mm, which is sufficient to engage the equator of the nucleus. Uh, what complications can happen with sclerocorneal tunnel? Uh, these are irregular incision. The uh, incision can be irregular. Uh, there can be button holding of the incision uh, if it is too superficial. There can be premature entry if the incision that you have given is uh, the tunnel you are making is too deep. And if the entry is not smooth or the blade is not good, the Desmet's membrane detachment can also occur. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nikhil. Yes, uh, the panelists for this particular talk, Dr. Kavita, Dr. Vijay, and Dr. Gulamali, uh, your comments, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, very, very lucid presentation, Dr. Nikhil. Uh, yes, I would just like to add a few tips for uh, youngsters. Yes, ma'am. Uh, one is when you are making the tunnel after the initial incision, your movement should be at the wrist. Uh, I don't know if you can see, like yes, it should be at the wrist. Okay, and not elbow. elbow. That is one. Uh, another is you should dissect the tissue and not cut it. When you're making the tunnel, you have to dissect it. You don't have to cut. Okay. Uh, third is if you are a right-handed person, after the initial incision, you start from the right end of the incision and then move to the left. And Opposite. if you are a left-handed person, then you start from the left end and go to the uh, right side. So uh, that will make your job uh, easier. Uh, another very rightly Nikhil pointed out uh, that when you are uh, entering the AC uh, with a keratome, you should uh, you know, uh, cut it only in the forward direction. And when you are coming out, you should not cut. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Vijay, you like to make any comments? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one is that when uh, we are passing superactus suture, we should have a proper light. Sometimes uh, we pass the suture without light and initially the residents, they are uh, in problem. Not uh, So they go sometimes deeper or they uh, take more conjunctiva in incision. Second thing that uh, when we are making a tunnel, we can hold with a one tooth forceps at six o'clock position so that it is easy to make a tunnel. So we can uh, take the help of tooth force up at six o'clock position. Third, in initial time, when residents are learning, uh, they uh, should have a habit to make a large incision so that they don't face difficulty in removing the nucleus with a small incision. And uh, when they have, suppose, premature entry into AC while making the tunnel, they can make a other, from the other part, they can enter and make a proper tunnel. And initially I would advise that they should be for a superficial tunnel rather they, than enter into the AC. Button holding is uh, easy to manage initially. You mean to say abandon the tunnel, improper tunnel and make a proper tunnel? Uh, any other comments? Dr. Sahu, sir, uh, uh, you are a master of making 
two millimeter yeah. incisions. See, so what, uh, nowadays uh, all these masters, I would like them not to teach the superior rectus stitch. They should do without it. And it is the if they want to go future, that uh, superior rectus uh, problem should be avoided because a lot of problems comes there from the beginner. Perforation can be there, muscle tearing will be there, traction. So many other things happens, but uh, we can do uh, now. The speculums are very good, so please uh, all the teachers focus on that. Doing SICS without superior rectus stitch. That may give a little confidence in the beginning, but uh, creates a lot of problem for that. That is one. Second thing, and when you are six o'clock holding, it should not be a mandatory. You can be see the where the person is comfortable, and the forceps should not be tooth forceps because it tears the conjunctiva like mad. So particularly for beginners, there has to be a little bit of process in that. Uh, so they can choose a comfortable position where they can stabilize the eye. So that is that point has to be kept in mind. Third thing that the vertical incision is not necessary. Vertical incision, then horizontal. That is a concept should go because we are doing with uh, tunnel knife and uh, we rather keep it little slant. But keep in mind how deep you are going because then healing becomes much better and you don't see the gap afterwards. So that the tripe and planner concept is all right, but the vertical and then horizontal, that thing should never be a thing. You know? So these three, three things everybody should correct and see. Dr. Sahu, yeah. I would like to know from you, what is an ideal incision for the beginners out of the five mentioned by Dr. Nikhil? One, hmm. two, what should a beginner do in case he is facing the problem of premature entry and is nervous. See, first of all, the beginners should not, not go for frown or uh, with the smile and all sort of things. Give a straight incision and give a one millimeter back cut. Yes. That gives him a lot of maneuvering position because when you, the blade is moving, you need not go straight because then your premature entry is there. But if you go from the side, and then uh, find the plane, that movement becomes very free inside. So you can go from the side and then come to the center. Many a time they go into the center and then they don't know who, where to, how to proceed. In the process, they apply more force. Uh, professors told me some uh, things. She was, was telling, make with your uh, hand. I will say that make, learn to make with your fingers. The, she was telling that not from the movement from the elbow. But uh, instead of elbow and hand, because hand also will put pressure. So if they know they will become artists, they will only with the finger movement, they can do lighter and more precise entry into inside. And if there is a premature entry, you go for the next plan and you just uh, go ahead. There is no problem. But in the beginning... One more thing I want to add, sir, in this that uh, intraocular pressure. Intraocular pressure of the eye, the, the eye ball must be uh, optimally uh, soft or hard to dissect in a single plane. Uh, the, the residents and everybody should know that the, the, what should be your intraocular pressure while dissecting a good uh, sclerocorneal pocket tunnel. Very so valid point. There should, there should, yeah, yeah, the pressure, if we, if we uh, the, keep your pressure very soft, very uh, low eye pressure, eye, eye intraocular pressure, then there would be a chance of button holding. Button, yes, sir. So uh, it is better yeah. to make a side port and put visco into the enter chamber prior to making tunnel yeah. insertion. Yeah, yeah. So the so the very soft eye, it is a very uh, high chance to create a button holding. Yeah. And yeah number two, number two, number two, yeah, the blade. The sharpness of blade is very important. Crescent. If you give a very sharper blade, the beginners or the, the, the directly they can create a premature entry. So sharpness of blade is very important. Always check the sharpness of the blade. Uh, in India, we used to do the uh, more than one surgeries with a crescent blade. So always keep mind that there is a sharpness of the blade is good or very sharp blade. So always check the sharpness at the beginning of the dissection and then proceed for the further dissection. Because uh, if the blade is very sharp, for example, the made in Japanese blades are very sharper. 
and they can create the premature entry so always keep in mind the sharpness of the blade is good or optimum or it is used in one or two two cases it is very important to keep in mind yes sir dr nikhil my two points yeah dr nikhil dr ravindran very nice presentation but uh, just just, just, a, just a point dr ravindran yes sir uh, what are your views about uh, cauterization of the vessels before making an incision a lot of controversies coming up don't do it do it minimum do it as per uh, case requirement so what do you propose for a beginner it starts with the uh, selection of site through the conjunctiva you can see the anterior scleral vessels which normally are abundant superiorly and uh, laterally where the muscles muscle arteries come anteriorly and about a millimeter or two they dip inside and they, they become anterior ciliary vessels so identify them and uh, avoid that area if you avoid that area massive bleeding will be totally avoided and i would prefer to minimize cartery and you know as i said such a beautiful technique i do not want to have a you know uh, wired diathermy at all in my table any wired thing comes from outside to the surgical area it contaminates so i would rather prefer to go back to the heat cartries heat cartery just heat or fine or like five one two three four five that's enough so i what i make the incision first then ask my assistant to put few drops of saline or pss on it you will see the bleeders coming out like a wet field cartery and then right. snap it and just touch it so there is no uh, you know just like uh, uh, they say blanket treatment or blanket uh, blasting of the entire sclera is not recommended even after some time there is another bleeder comes in they just touch the area minor bleeders will stop on their own and intra tunnel bleeders you should never cauterize don't lift it and cauterize because the whole tunnel structure will go bad okay. you identify it is bleeding from the blood vessel is coming from somewhere from somewhere either on that on the surface you can see even beyond the tunnel if you see the blood vessel coming like that and then it's so the tunnel again and then passing it cauterize the outside don't go inside even if there is an intra scleral intra tunnel bleeding you cauterize from the top don't go inside from the top minimally just to stop it So all these manoeuvres you can do. I would like to add one more point on superiorus suture. Can I add here? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Fine. Actually, in cataract surgery, superior rectus suture is not necessary at all. It's it's a superfluous thing. The only way why you need is because you are operating from from twelve o'clock. You need to shift the eye down because of manoeuvring and tunnel creation. They're all very primitive blades that you we are using it. we don't need a 3 mm long blade your tunnel length is 2 2.5 or blade length is 5 mm the, the most of the crescents you take from the hub to the tip is 5 mm so to create that space you have to push the eye down and you have to turn the eye down so if you i have modified the whole set of instruments the crescent can be just 2.5 so you don't have to uh, say especially when you're doing on a topical the crescent keeps touching the upper lid and patient will have feel so shorten all these instruments when you go there by very short small small instrument in that day and as far as superactors forceps is concerned he gave a very beautiful close it close the superactors forceps take it after you touch the uh, tissue conjunctiva open it and grasp it 7 or 8 mm away from the limb so you know that you are dead on the superactor and then cotton suture i've seen in the past we have used lot of cotton sutures A cotton to linen sutures to pass it double slit they very traumatic huge needles lot of trauma superactors and post operative hyperphoria is very common post operative binocular vision uh, symptoms signs it's very common it's, it's one study has said 20% of people who have this large needle superactor suture have got some amount of induced hyperphoria which causes binocular vision of normalities so then at that time this is almost 20 years ago i switched over to a traumatic nylon sutures so a traumatic 8 mm 10 mm nylon sutures are available the long thread you cut it to about 6 inches and you can reuse it nylon there is nothing happens to it it's basically a nylon and a needle you can autoclave it consider it as an instrument and use it and it is saturated needle goes through the spectrus beautiful all cotton threads threadable threads had to be changed to atraumatic sutures for superactors in case you want to use superactors a very quick comment about a clear corneal tunnel for sics 
Oh, uh, uh, Arun, can I can I come in? Yes, sir. I do not want to tell. See, uh, on the on the base uh, the country thing, you know, the ballpoint country uh, experience hand it is fine because uh, I've seen Rauth using and Ravindra must be using. They they have very controlled thing. But if you give a beginner this ballpoint country, I've seen scleral melting and burning and scarring and so many other things happens. So ideally from the beginner, they should use wet field country and erase it, not uh, just erasing uh, the little bit of heat and the blood vessels just, uh, you get a very clear field. So ballpoint country as far as is possible, beginner should not uh, go for it unless they have developed a skill how much the, they can the, touch, the, where to touch. So, so, so the problem is none of these are re-sterilized. They, they, they keep using it from one case, another case, another case. I mean, that's what I really hate. If you want to, uh, SciCS is such a beautiful system where everything goes out and then the fresh set comes to you. And uh, if you have a system wherein you can change the, uh, you know, wet field cartridge for every case, it's absolutely fine. But then how many centers will have 10 wet field cartridges? They keep one wet field cartridge and use it for the whole day. This is my serious objection. Not only you look at how well you do surgery and how well you keep asepsis is not the, also the other issue. If you use ball pot, the, the one yeah. I said is put it on a flame, same flame, count numbers, one, two, three, four, five, see if it's working, otherwise it's count 10. So teach everybody how long it has to be counted. Uh, so that uh, works like a rheostat. Even in uh, wet field, you have to adjust the rheostat to one, two, three, four, depending upon the amount of heat that's generated. Same way by counting, keeping it on the flame, you can titrate the amount of heat and uh, it, it, as you rightly said, it should be touch and go. You, you're not going to press this pira with the, any kind of cartridge. Can, can we talk something about the placement of the incision? Dr. Dhaliwal, you are a friend of uh, temporal incisions. So what about I the keratom preoperative keratomity? Do you take them in consideration? Yes, I do take the pre-op keratometry into consideration. All against the rule astigmatism cases are operated uh, uh, temporally. And wherever we want the SIA to be the least, we keep we go temporally. Because superiorly, SIA is more in our hands. That's it. How about a clear corneal tunnel can in SICS? In a can you just add one thing there on placing yeah. the incision? Uh, actually, you should go for on steep incision. So, I mean, we all do, uh, you know, keratometry preoperatively. So, on steep incision will give. On steep the incision. Side. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. And anastigmatic, anastigmatic cases can be operated superior temporally also. And. Uh, Nearer the limbus you add to your SIA, further back you reduce the SIA. So somebody was discussing with me two, three days back, the SIA in temporal is very less. So how do we increase it? Go, we go limbal and increase the length of the incision. That's it. So if you want to correct more of astigmatism on the cornea, if there's a pre-existing astigmatism, you need to make your incision near to the limbus and near to the limbus yes and if the astigmatism is low or there's no astigmatism make a, uh, an astigmatic incision slightly away from the limbus from so the corneal incision they'll uh, since the incision is large in uh, SICS the corneal incision will create a lot of astigmatism in my view I don't know no, what but, the others but have. No, no what we uh, oh. understood in the recent times is that a clear corneal uh, tunnel, small in size, making a phaco fracture or getting uh, many fragments of the nucleus within the anterior chamber and visco expressing them out can help. So, uh, what are your views, Dr. Sahu or Dr. Yeah, Ravindran? Uh, well, the cornea is not for us. From SICS surgeon, cornea is not for us. Yes. Because that let, let us leave it to the phaco surgeon because and we have a much stabler place. And uh, if you are really a fund, fund of uh, cornea, then I think Ravindra is doing limbal uh, incision and that can be practiced. He, is, uh, he has uh, developed that transconjectival 
limbal incision which is a innovative thing you know that uh, that should be followed but cornea we should leave aside because cornea when we have got a stable uh, structure like sclera why should we go for the cornea then and then create a lot of astigmatism and problems see doing a cataract surgery i have gone through cornea and in the beginning i have said it is not worth because you are you as a excise surgeon you are almost going to touch the endothelium if you are bringing your vectris inside and then bringing it out and you are very close to the uh, this thing but if i am going the sclera the depth is sufficient for my vectris to go inside so for all practical process sic surgeon should never go to cornea that's uh, my thinking yes and i i would i would like to add here the charm of sics is we can spare the limbal stem cells so we go scleral i won't prefer a limbal incision even because we must spare the stem cells and the uh, the other we uh, i rephrase my sentence we can save a patient from becoming a dry eye case with sics that, that is a good point but uh, it, is, it is a point for research we have not done sufficient research to give an opinion but uh, now it is a experimental stage we are going on and the uh, ravindra has developed it uh, let us have uh, some people go into research and come out with uh, how much limbal cell we are losing and uh, that will be a uh, good help for all of us uh, so let's you... cut down our in, uh, discussion on incisions here because we are running very very short of time uh, can we go on to the next topic on capsulorexes and hydro procedures they are very important hydro procedures are very important in the sics dr brijesh uh, please go ahead with your uh, recently i did some work on incision i just want to mention in a very few words i started following dr ravindra's technique of doing incision in one go to start with very slight tunnel then entry with 2.5 or 2.8 and then 5.2 mm extension keratome i have two category of patients number one charitable setup where mostly i use pharma lenses and in personal uh, foldable lenses so the difference of astigmatism is so much in all my private patients where i use foldable lenses where i can reduce the astigmatism it is only 0 to 0.5 yesterday i did two private cases and five charitable cases so today morning when i examine the astigmatism in my private case where i 5.2 mm incision is given it is only 0 and 0.5 but it is more than one in rest of the five cases where i have to extend so if you give the incision in one go that really makes the difference one thing i would like i think we cannot give this message to the newcomers and the who are here to learn the basics let's uh, not confuse the people who are here to learn the basics let them uh, let's teach them the traditional way yes <laughs> once you uh, attain a certain level of expertise yes you can go in for the single yeah yeah you are right that we will cover in our next uh, Arun, Arun, webinar for, for beginners i would like to mention for closer of the incision we have to take care of tenons also because yes. if if we are separating the tenon from conjunctiva then we have to reposit it separately if we are taking along with that as dr ravindra is taking conjunctiva as tenon one go then there is just you can adhere there but if tenon is retracted then conjunctiva will set on the sclera and then healing with be fibrosis and those fibroblasts will cause dry eye symptoms another cause of dry eye so just take care to start with just take care that tenon should be respected accordingly and just i want to make one point only for the newcomers while making the incision and while fixing the eyeball never hold the lip of this section it yes. will cause more and more astigmatism because they don't start they don't fix the eye, they don't i mean able to fix up eye ball they just try to hold the uh, lip it should be avoided or we go to the next speaker yes dr brijesh uh, your screen please dr arvind more dr swati tomar and dr jayshree singh will be the panelists for this uh, please share your screen dr brijesh dr arun can i say one one message here very important message 
Yes, sir. When you're making a grew on this clear, this grew should be very superficial. One fourth, one fourth. And with the tunneling, you go deeper. Imagine you have made a grew there, which is three fourth of sclera or more than half sclera. Then uh, that is the one which causes maximum amount of SIA, surgeons induced astigmatism, because the sclera has become weaker at that point and it's going to stretch there. So the, initial horizontal uh, chevron, whatever you're making, that incision should be only one fourth of sclera and deepen it as you go anterior. We used to call it a scratch incision in our earlier days. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Dr. Bridges. Good afternoon, sir. First of all, I would like to thank uh, International Society of MSICS, ROS, uh, Dr. Nepalia, sir, Dr. Rakesh Purwal, sir, and uh, Dr. Arun Shetrapal, sir, for giving me the opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, sir, is it sharing? Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. Now the uh, capsule opening, which is called the capsulotomy, is of three uh, can be done with three types: the can opener, envelope, and CCC. In the capsular axis, it is a form of capsulotomy in which the opening is made in the anti capsule in a smooth circular pattern along the periphery of the lens uh, to enable the removal of the opaque lens material during the ECC surgery. The CCC should be continuous; it should not essentially be circular. Uh, curvy linear centered on the pupil its size it will depend upon the eye optic size which should be less 0.5 to 1 mm uh, from the optic size of the eye and depending on the size and type of the nucleus it, uh, if the nucleus is bigger uh, the uh, capsule axis should then bigger and uh, the complication which can arise uh, too large size will lead to subluxation of the eye in the antechamber or decentration of the eye and if it is too small it can lead to uh, anterior capsule phimosis and difficulty in collapsing the nucleus into the ac uh, now the basic techniques uh, are of three types one is from the cystitome alone and second from the forceps and third from the combination of these two in the combination we initially cut the uh, capsule with the cystitome and then most of the tear tearing of the capsule is done with the forceps and we need a major one to use the forceps fundamentals uh, we should have the anatomical orientation uh, the, about the and about uh, creation of the capsule flap uh, stabbing slicing tanting and folding of the capsule and creation of the continuous curvilinear capsule that's anatomical orientation uh, these are the uh, four cardinal points which we need to know uh, holding of the capsule, we have a long hold, mid hold, and short hold. Uh, shearing and ripping forces, which are used during the capsule axis shearing force. In shearing, uh, we apply the force in the direction of the tear, and in the ripping, we apply the force in the direction perpendicular to the intended tear. Now, this in this diagram, it is showing the initial stabbing of the uh, anterior capsule of the lens. Now slicing, the slicing is done uh, from the cutting edge of the needle sideways and capsule slice should end reasonably distance from the iris margin. Tanting of the, it is done from the tip of the needle. The capsule is folded over by pushing in direction which is parallel to the vertical meridian. This is the axis propagation done with uh, sequentially from 6 o'clock to 3 o'clock and to 12 o'clock position. Completion of uh, the axis is done by uh, pushing the axis tear completely with a C-shape movement at 9 o'clock position. Now the key is for a good CCC, we should use adequate amount of viscoelastic and people should be dilated properly. We should have a balance in the interlamental lenticular pressure and pressure in the AC. Capsule should be perpendicular to the microscope uh, and the eye should be perpendicular to the microscope, not the slanting downwards or backward. Uh, there should be good control of the eye mobility. Uh, capsule axis through side port should be done uh, so that there is uh, less leakage of the viscoelastic from the antechamber. Uh, if there is a poor red reflex, we should stain the capsule with trephan blue or ICG. Potential complications which can arrive, uh, there can be tear, we can start to go radial. We should 
uh, add OVD and use forceps or call your seniors for a beginners. And if uh, radial tear, you we can use also scissor to restart in another direction or can convert to can opener. If it is too small, uh, we we have to fill OVD and do the larger access with the forceps and analog after placing the IL. If it is too big, we, we should myose the pupil to prevent the capture of the iron post-operatively. And if there is journal laxity, we should consider uh, placing iris hooks or CTR to stabilize the capsule during the surgery. Now the hydro procedures. Hydro procedures are of two types, hydro dissection and hydro delineation. Hydro dissection in this, we infuse the fluid uh, between the anti-capsule and the cortex of the lens. It separates the capsule from the rest of the nucleus. It, it facilitates the nucleus rotation and manipulation during the surgery and uh, prolapsing in the AC. Uh, indicators, what are the indicators of successful hydrodissection? These are the shallowing of the anterior chamber and rotation, pre-rotation of the nucleus should happen. Hydrodissections, we should know about the fundamental principle and science to look during the hydrodissection. We should always burp viscoelastic to pre, uh, create uh, space in the AC to injecting the fluid, then we should inject fluid between the capsule and the cortex. We should observe the fluid wave during the hydrodissection we are doing and red reflex with change after the hydrodissection is completed. And we should always depress the lens to complete the hydrodissection. These are the steps. Uh, hydrodelineation, in this we infuse the fluid between the apinucleus and nucleus of the lens. The fluid wave will appear as the golden ring as shown in the picture. It is basically done to debulk the nucleus uh, so that uh, it will facilitate the smooth delivery of the nucleus uh, from the tunnel also. Uh, to conclude, I have a brief video about these two processes. Cut is given and now the forceps has been used. shape movement to conclude the access. This, this is the fluid wave we have seen. And this, this is showing the delineations. A golden ring is visible now. Thank you. Thank you all for hearing. Thank you, Dr. Bijesh. Uh, very concise and very good talk. Uh, I'll request the panelist, Dr. Swati, Dr. Arwin, Dr. Jeshi, to please uh, make your comments. I think uh, Brijesh presented really well and a uh, very important step of uh, uh, making a rexus is that how you move your uh, needle or your forceps. So anytime that we feel that uh, the... Uh, especially for beginners and for everybody, anytime that we feel that the rexus is going to go out or it's going to be a little bigger than what we desire is that you start pulling it centripetally and start to change from the needle to a forceps if you are accustomed to doing with a needle. And uh, anytime that you feel that it is too, too small a size, then you can actually take it a little more forwards and uh, with the help of, again, the rexus forceps and make, a, make it a little bigger. What you showed was very, very good because the sharing and the tearing forces, they act in combination and you need to realize where you want to use these forces to the best of the size and a more uh, regular this. I would also suggest that if you get a radial cut, then it is not uh, important that you abandon the rexes itself. You can still go ahead and uh, it may be changed to a forceps and kind of uh, go up to, up to whatever extent that you can catch hold of it just near the flap at the turn of the flap and again keep pulling it to the center so that you can actually catch it so we should not be uh, you know anxious that we got it a little more radial and it's going and turning out so this is what i would 
practically say some tips maybe okay. others can actually add in more dr jeshri dr jeshri are you there yes dr dhaliwal you want to say something uh, i i for one word suggest a slightly oval capsule rexus and a little eccentric towards the tunnel it makes all the rest of the steps very easy and we are very comfortable later on that bringing out the nucleus placement of the implant and then uh, that uh, 12 o'clock cortex aspiration, aspiration of the cortex yes subcapsular subcapsular sub yes subcapsular that becomes easy it is really nice uh, dr vijesh uh, i want to say point Uh, Dr. Vijesh, yes, uh, wonderful presentation. Compliments. Uh, yes, at the same time, uh, while learning these procedures, one should know when you are supposed not to undertake these procedures. So, can you highlight those situations where you should defer or uh, restrain from doing these undertaking these hydro procedures? Sir, uh, hydro, sir, hydro delineation or uh... I mean both kind. Mm-hmm. Say. i give you a direct hint if you are operating a case of uh, posterior capsular cataract then what should be your plan should you go for the hydro procedures or you should resist or do it minimum uh, uh, there is a chance of posterior rent uh, okay PCR. leave it to dr sau dr sau sir your comments for a beginner for these three two queries so you are muted please unmute yourself me yeah what is the question question was that the, the speaker has well explained the hydro procedures but for a beginner he should also know where he has to uh, refrain from doing these procedures what are those uh, types of cataract where you, you would definitely affecting a posterior posterior yes. capsular uh, subcapsular uh, subcapsular yeah. thing and then you do a hydro delineation why should you go for a hydro dissection because you don't know what is lying behind so it is always better to do a delineation rather than dissection i would i would like to uh, uh, call upon dr ravindra to speak on this for a minute dr ravindra he i think he would have a different opinion couple of points i would like to insist for post graduate sees uh, never do hydro delineation it's, it's not A golden ring is a complication. It is not something which you desire because it has to be capsular separating hydro dissection. That's the only thing that you need. Nothing else. You have to separate the capsule from the cortex, and then again, hydro dissection has got nothing to do with your nucleus management. Nucleus management is a totally different plane. Hydro dissection is a totally different plane. And always do a trypan blue staining under air. So what I do is I take. Uh, Small thermal syringe and uh, fill one of uh, trypan blue. Two drops, three drops is good enough. But in the hub, I keep the air. So when you push trypan blue, first air goes inside, and then this is done before you put a viscoelastic. Air goes inside, and then you take the needle, candle tip in the center of the air, and push it. And you know when the air is sitting on the anterior capsule, that area is dry, and Few drops of trypan blue, you can see it falling on the dry anterior capsule. It will instantaneously stain the anterior capsule. That's the best way. If you put a viscoelastic, then try to stain it, and the dye will not reach the anterior capsule. This is a small tip I would like to say. But the rex is sharing, sharing force and tearing force are two separate forces. There are two separate ways of doing hydro dissection. In sharing force, if I can take an example, and actually you 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 fold the capsule on the top of The existing capsule and then tear it along it. That's the sharing. You tear it and when you want to tear it, you're not going to fold it. Unfold it and tear it like that. Take a paper. I don't know. Take a paper and tear it. That's a tearing. Sharing is fold the flap and tear. Both are separate. Normally use sharing for only for the the capsular axis. Where do you use tearing force? You would unfold the folded capsule and tear it like a paper, and that is only when it's running outside. The direction of the sharing force is along the direction of tear, 
by the tearing force is perpendicular to the direction of tear. I don't know. Can I use a whiteboard if the time permits? Yeah, yeah, please. <clears throat> yeah, that's a capsular axis. Is it visible now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. That's the axis you are doing it. And uh, uh, you start with a flap like that and hold it on the top of it. So ultimately it becomes something like this. It's folded in the top of the capsule. Okay. This one, you hold it and pull along, the folded capsule, and that is the shearing force. And tearing force, imagine that is the, uh, the tear, the direction. You have gone up to there. It's going peripherally. Then what you do is, this is folded like that. Initially, it's folded like that. So you unfold it, and then and you you that's the tear you're going to produce. The pull of this capsule, this this is the rexis. You come up to there, you have unfolded it, and this is trying to go outside. Now the pull of the capsule is in the in that direction. So this capsule is held by the zonules, but this is being pulled. This is a tearing force. Now this tear can be brought inside. Then again, after that, you you continue with the sharing. So uh, this is what I would like to uh, point out. I would just elaborate with this paper. Yeah. Now, if you are tearing this paper like this along the line, so this, uh, can you see this? This is sharing. I'm tearing it like this. Now, if I hold the paper like this and pull them apart, I, I don't know if it's visible. Yeah, it's visible now. Yeah, that's staring now. That's, that's staring. staring. And if it is like this, this is, and if you pull them like this at 90 Fair. degrees, this is there. Yeah, that's that's a that's a this is these two differences you will have to understand before you try the rexis. The next thing I would like to tell is can I take another half a minute? Yes, please do. Dr. Ravindran, yeah. since we are holding this webinar for uh, the uh, beginners, yeah. which kind of capsular access would you uh, recommend and why? Okay. Uh, I would, I would uh, even now, I, I do not want to take the capsular access process unless there is a complication. I would like to prefer the cystitome. And there are so many, I can keep on talking for the next half an hour and just creating a cystitome. For, uh, we are at hydrodissection. I'll finish that and then come to the cystitome, sir. Normally, hydrodissection cannulas you should do at 27 gauge needle. That's available commercially. That's the best one. And uh, uh, now, if you look at the uh, cross section, that's the lens there. That's a cataract. And you see, the hydrodissection can only be done if you have taken the cannula up to that. Most of the people. Take the cannula. Yeah, you are going. You are going subcapsular. Or is subcapsular, right at the below the capsular. Most of the people direct the fluid in that direction, and the fluid will hit the under capsule and come back. You will never have successful rexis. If you want a successful uh, hydrodissection, the direction of the cannula should not only be lateral but also should be downwards in that direction. So just two drops of fluid is enough for the fluid to go hit the uh, equator and come back here. This is the secret of the uh, doing good hydrodissection. Then how do you modify modified the cannula? Normally, a cannula comes like that. You're all aware. This is 7 millimeter. This is a 27 gauge cannula. I'm sorry, I'm bad in writing on mouse. So this is a long one. With this, you cannot take it to the point I've told you. What I've done is I straightened that. I straightened this. By, by you know taking inside another cannula mm -hmm. and my hydrodissection cannula is only two millimeters at the tip. My head modified hydrodissection which you can do it is only at two millimeters at the tip mm -hmm. and takes its right one. And with this, imagine that is the eye, that's my tunnel, wherever it is. Temporal tunnels are the best for SIC surgery. Superior tunnels are, you know, like, I don't like them. Uh, that's a hydrodissection rexis you have made. I take the entire cannula there and then go there, take the cannula, 
and 2 mm at 45 degrees. It's not at 90 degrees, it's 45 degrees. Then the capsule. And then I rotate it axially. What I mean to say, now analyze being end on, it is like that. I rotate, I rotate it axially so that it goes in the direction now instead of facing laterally, now it is facing downwards. And that, that is the, uh, the lens there. It goes downwards by actually rotating it downwards. So I'll have a beautiful hydro dissection. So Self-modified instead of seven millimeter, eight millimeter long. Uh, you straighten it by passing it through through a thick bore cannula and again rebend it. And that will be a fantastic. It's not available in the market. So you'll have to make it yourself. The, as far as the, uh, what is your question, sir? The height, the, the... So I think we sum up around with right. the comment that all beginners must stain the anterior lens capsule before starting their access. Whether yes. it's a grade one nucleus or grade two or grade four okay. or grade five, it is it, it should be mandatory for all the beginners to stain the capsule with Tiffan blue and then uh, do the access. That will make the things more con convenient and uh, I mean, uh, the uh, learning curve would be very small. We go to the next speaker, Dr. Arun. Uh, now I will call upon Dr. Sujit. Yes. He will be talking about nucleus management and delivery. And Dr. Rajesh Goel, Dr. Giraj Soni, and Dr. Suresh will be the panelists for this talk. Dr. Sujit, please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll be talking on techniques of nucleus prolapse and delivery in SICS. First, I would like to thank ISMSICS, Rajasthan Ophthalmological Society, uh, my HOD, uh, Dr. Kavita Bhattnagar, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to speak on such a platform. Uh, so first I'll give the overview what we're going to discuss. The nucleus management will be divided into two parts. First will be the nucleus prolapse and then nucleus delivery. The nucleus prolapse will be looking briefly on hydroprolapse, viscoprolapse, prolapse with Sinsky hook, which will include both single hook method and bimanual method and prolapsing of the nucleus in few special conditions. Uh, in nucleus delivery, we'll be focusing on hydro expression, which will include the blue menthol technique and the irrigating wire vectors, taco punch technique, fish hook technique, and with uh, nucleus delivery with visco cannula. So starting with the first uh, procedure, which is the hydro prolapse. In this, the hydro dissection cannula is passed under the anterior uh, capsule perpendicular to the capsular excess margin, and the bolus of fluid is injected. And this lifts the pole of the nucleus on the opposite side out of the capsular bag. And once one pole of the nucleus is maneuvered out of the bag, the remaining uh, is prolapsed into the anterior chamber by rotating the nucleus uh, uh, with the help of Sinsky hook. The advantage uh, of uh, hydroprolapse is that uh, it is an easy procedure and can be done as a continuation of the hydro procedures which were uh, being discussed earlier and it is ideal for prolapsing soft nucleus but uh, uh, the disadvantage is that it needs a capsular uh, uh, capsular excess size of around 5.5 millimeter uh, for this procedure to be done. In coming to viscoprolapse, uh, uh, it, uh, in viscoprolapse it is very similar to hydroprolapse, but uh, here 2% HPMC solution is used uh, for capsular excess near the capsular phonics, similar to hydroprolapse, and it is also used for uh, soft uh, cataract. And the prerequisite is adequate pupillary dilatation and adequate size of the capsular excess. When coming to prolapse with Sinsky hook, it is suitable for moderate to hard nucleus. It can be performed either with a single Sinsky hook or two Sinsky hook bi uh, manually. First, we'll uh, look at the procedure for single uh, Sinsky hook. So after thorough hydro dissection and hydro delineation, the AC is inflated with uh, OVDs and the Sinsky hook is passed through the main incision. The center of the nucleus is felt uh, with the hook, uh, which is taken up to the equator of the nucleus, tracing the surface of the nucleus. And once the equator is reached, the Sinsky hook is passed into the surrounding epinuclear cortex, and the nucleus is then cartwheeled, and then uh, it comes out through the tunnel. The bimanual technique uh, is uh, uh, vaguely divided into two types of technique. The, more, uh, the difference between them is that the first technique, the, uh, uh, the hook or uh, iris repository is passed through the side port and the nucleus is gently pushed posteriorly. Whereas in the second technique, it is pushed inferiorly exposing the superior pole of the nucleus. And then the hook is placed under the superior pole of the nucleus and lifted to a plane in front of the anterior capsule. And more uh, OVD is injected so that there is enough space for uh, the second Sinsky hook and 
the nucleus is prolapsed into the anterior chamber by uh, by the same technique out of the tunnel so uh, there is a picture depicting on the left side nucleus prolapse with a single sinski hook and on the uh, right side is bimanual prolapse uh, we can see two sinski hooks are used uh, to prolapse the nucleus Uh, coming to nucleus prolapse in special cases in small pupil uh, if the uh, uh, the pupil can either be rigid or the pupil uh, 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 can be stretched if it is not rigid it can be stretched to one side uh, with an iris repositor uh, uh, which can be inserted through the side port uh, with sinski hook uh, inserted through the main bone the nucleus can be prolapsed in the usual manner but if the pupil is rigid one we have to uh, use pupillary expanders or uh, we can uh, we have to deal with pupilloplasty techniques in cases of large hard nucleus either a large capsular excess has to be performed or it has to be prudent to give multiple relaxing incisions to the capsular excess margins so that to minimize the stress on the genules and uh, decrease the uh, complications as to uh, in hypermature cataract Uh, there is no counter support for the nucleus so ac is filled with oclo uh, visco uh, uh, devices and iris repositor used to gently press at the capsular excess margin and the small nucleus uh, 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 which is floating in the back comes into the anterior chamber then coming to the nucleus delivery techniques uh, first we'll be taking the anterior chamber maintainer technique which is the blue menthol technique so the basic principle uh, uh, of the blue menthol technique is that Uh, once the nucleus is into the anterior chamber the tip of the uh, the basic principle is that to elevate the hydrostatic pressure in the anterior chamber so when the floor of the tunnel is depressed the nucleus comes out through the tunnel following a pressure gradient so once the nucleus is in the ac the tip of the sheets guide is gently introduced uh and the uh, uh, the tip of the sheets guide is gently introduced up to one third of the nucleus and uh, with the iris spatula or macpherson forceps the tunnel is depressed by pressing on the glide so the nucleus get engaged in the tunnel and it at this point of time the bottle height is increased uh, which increases uh, up to 70 mm which increases the hydrostatic pressure in the ac and the nucleus uh, comes out through the tunnel the advantage of the blue menthol technique is that ovds are not required after every step as it uses uh, the anterior chamber maintainer technique and uh, we should take caution that the glide should not be inserted under the nucleus too much as to uh, towards the 6 o'clock so that it uh, to prevent uh, posterior capsular rent in coming to the next procedure which is hydro expression with irrigating wire vectors so after luxation of the nucleus into the anterior chamber ovds are placed above and below the nucleus and the patency of the irrigating vectors is tested before surgery uh, the irrigating wire vectors can be used to deliver the nucleus either by two techniques either by hydro expression or by visco uh, expression in case of visco expression the vectors is attached to a syringe having low molecular weight viscoelastic substance so uh, uh, during hydro expression with irrigating wire vectors the following maneuver should happen in big succession uh, for the safe removal of the nucleus the first is the irrigating vector uh, should be withdrawn slowly without irrigation to engage the superior pole of the nucleus into the tunnel superior rectus bridal suture which was uh, previously given at the start of the surgery should be pulled to fix the globe the fluid is injected slowly while pressing the floor of the tunnel to build a hydrostatic pressure in the anterior chamber as the nucleus blocks the tunnel and the vectus is slowly pulled out with the nucleus uh, uh, and the nucleus comes out uh, along with the vectus due to increase hydrostatic pressure uh, here is a picture which is uh, on the left side a is depicting the uh, the testing of patency of irrigating wire vectus and the second there is nucleus extraction uh, with the help of irrigating wire vectus the next technique which we'll be discussing is a fecus sandwich technique in which uh, one instrument is the uh, uh, a wire vectus and the other can be a sinski hook or a fecus uh, or a uh, or a uh, uh, visco probe so the initial step uh, are the same uh, the floor of the tunnel is depressed with the vectus held in the left hand the superior pole of the nucleus gets engaged in the tunnel and ovds are injected under the nucleus which pushes the iris back so that it does not come out or uh, with the vectus or there is no iridodialysis then the vectus is slightly depressed posteriorly to create more space in the anterior chamber and at the same time ovd is uh, uh, is pushed between the nucleus and the endothelium so Uh, uh, from here uh, either the second instrument can be sinski hook or the visco cannula so uh, in the sinski hook method sinski hook uh, is taken in the right hand is introduced into the ac over the nucleus the hook is pressed against the nucleus to sandwich the nucleus between it and the vectus and this and the sandwich nucleus is pulled out of the anterior chamber 
uh, if we are using visco cannula to sandwich uh, 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 the uh, nucleus uh, uh, visco is constantly injected into the nta chamber as the nucleus is delivered so that the ec is uh, it remains formed and the endothelium is pr uh, protected the advantage of the phaco sandwich technique is the short learning curve reduced surgical time and it ensures removal of the nucleus in one piece whereas uh, the disadvantage is the tunnel size may have to be increased more than 6.5 mm if the nucleus is large and uh, the chances of endothelial damage are more as two instruments are being maneuvered in the uh, anti chamber at the same time uh, here is a picture depicting the phaco sandwich with sinks cube on the left side and phaco sandwich with visco cannula on the uh, uh, right side coming to the next technique which is visco expression which is also known as phaco punch technique uh, it is done uh, after thorough hydrodelination is done to minimize the nucleus which is freed of the epinucleus nucleus is luxated into nda chamber and chamber is filled with uh, ovds the superior rectus parietal suture is tightened the curved visco cannula is inserted under the nucleus ovds are injected and uh, simultaneously the full floor of the tunnel is depressed with the cannula itself so along with the ovd the nucleus also comes out the advantages of the visco expression technique is short learning curve and the endothelium is protected throughout the surgery and the posterior capsular tears are very rare the disadvantage is that this procedure is suitable for soft cataracts and smaller nuclei and for larger nucleus the tunnel size of the tunnel uh, has to be uh, increased is a video of the visco expression Here we can see uh, uh, visco is uh, put above and below the uh, nucleus, and the posterior lip of the tunnel is being pressed with the visco while injecting the OVD, and it comes out along with the uh, uh, visco substance. The next technique uh, uh, will be Henning's fish hook uh, uh, technique, which was introduced in 1997 by Do uh, Dr. Albert Henning in Lahan Hospital in Southeast Nepal. So the procedure of the technique is uh, OVD is injected into the NTA chamber. and capsular bag between the nucleus and the posterior capsule so the upper pole of the nucleus is partially prolapsed into the ac the hook is introduced uh, with a sharp tip of the needle facing the right side into the capsular bag between the nucleus and the posterior capsule then the hook is turned up and slightly pulled back so that the needle tip is engaged into the central lower portion of the nucleus and without lifting the nucleus it is taken out from the capsular bag uh, then through the tunnel uh, outside the advantages of henning fish hook technique or lahan technique is that it has a shorter learning curve safe fast and inexpensive technique and it is the only technique to extract the nucleus directly from the bag avoiding endothelial touch and nucleus extraction requires a small tunnel size than nucleus removal uh, as by hydro expression uh, here is a small description of the fish hook which is used in the lahan technique the fish hook is made of 30 gauge half inch disposable needle bending, uh, bending it with the help of needle holder two bends are present Uh, the tip of the needle which will insert into the central nucleus and the slight bend over the middle shaft which will help in uh, folding of the nucleus in the bag in coming to the phaco fracture and the phaco section technique uh, the phaco fracture technique refers to the delivery of nucleus after dividing into pieces through the scleroconian tunnel over the years many methods have been introduced to reduce the incision size uh, uh, a few of them are bisector technique trisector technique wire loop technique phaco fracture at the exit of the tunnel phaco fragmentation by the slide prensel technique or the chop section technique there is a video uh, video of the phaco fracture technique we can see that the nucleus is divided into two parts while coming out through the new uh, uh, tunnel and then after uh, uh, aligning the nucleus along with the tunnel a second attempt is made and the whole of the nucleus is taken out so the take home message uh, for me the use of nuclear delivery technique should be according to surgeon's comfort level and newer innovative techniques may be used by experts thank you uh thank you uh, very much <clears throat> uh can i ask the panelists now to add upon to what has been said already panelists yeah this uh, using up a cisco hook to bring out the nucleus is not a very 
good proposition eh, because many a time their lens can be broken so, so that is not a dialer i am used a dialer modified dialer then uh, because the cisco hook has got a pointed hand and the nucleus can break and if it is a soft cataract it becomes really problematic so that uh, point has to be kept in mind and the, uh, now the breaking of the nucleus uh, as it has been shown i have uh, what i'm doing that uh, we have this uh, visco cannula you just press the tip of the visco cannula and make it flatter it is a rounded cannula you make it flat by your artery forcep you just press the tip the flat and then you put it above the lens and the vectus is below you go on continuously injecting uh, visco and then go on slicing the nucleus so thereby you maintain the chamber and uh, easily break the lens and take it out you don't have to use a uh, you know instrument uh, where the visco is not there sometimes you may touch the endothelium but if your visco is continuously going through your hand so the chance of uh, damaging endothelium is reduced that is how i break my lens uh, dr parikshit uh, what's your preferred technique Please unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. So my technique is I do visco expression, uh, a visco expression with a vectus or a irrigating vectus. What Dr. Sahu sir is saying is using a Sinsky hook is dangerous. But then we know that while doing manual small incision cataract surgery, we have to be very careful of the endothelium whenever we are put an extra instrument. And but like most techniques of manual SICS, it depends greatly on surgeon skill, and we have to be just more careful. The endothelium is something which is always at risk, so just use lots of visco is what I would say. Uh, Doctor Ravindran, you have uh, you are used to using two instrument inside the AC to break the nucleus into two. So, uh, how do you protect your endothelium when you are inserting two instruments together? The, the initially, uh, the viral vectus goes under the nucleus, and uh, uh, it's, it's very thin, so it hardly occupies. And uh, when you are passing, Ra Ravindra, Ravindra, you speak little loud. Many a time, your voice becomes muffled. Okay, I'll come nearer uh, and speak. Yeah. So, yes. the, uh, when you are passing the viral vect vir vectus, there are I have devised about two dozen types of them. And uh, every nucleus probably needs a special nucleus and tunnel. It's a combination. And the wire vector selection is extremely important. If it is too narrow, the lens nucleus can topple in one side when you're bisecting and damaging the endothelium. So it has to support the nucleus right in the center. See that the iris is not included in it. Otherwise, you'll have a dialysis at the end of your Even through a dense nucleus, you can see the iris. That is, every time you'll have to see whether the, you're catching the iris in this especially in a small people situation. And bisecting is with Sinsky hook. Sinsky hook, it goes, uh, no, I'm sorry, bisecting is always done with an irrigating cannula. I take a 25 gauge cannula uh, filled with uh, dispersed viscoelastic, and the syringe has to be lower lock type. Imagine it's an ordinary syringe, when you're pressing it, the needle the cannula can come out of the syringe. So always for this purpose, lock the uh, cannula onto the lower lock, it's a 2 ml, and you keep pushing the viscoelastic under whatever technique of nuclear management that you are you have seen it. In addition to that, continuously inject viscoelastic dispersive in front of the nucleus. As the nucleus is coming out, don't, don't let it go wherever it wants to go. Always keep the cannula on the top of the nucleus Keep injecting it and taking it out together. Any technique is all right. That will save the uh, endothelium maximally. The, I saw beautiful videos by Dr. Uh, uh, I forgot his name. Uh, he showed both of them. The nucleus came out all right, but as it's coming out, in spite of filling the AC with viscoelastic, it can still go and drop it. If you have placed a cannula on top of it and then keep injecting as the nucleus comes out, that gives an additional protection. I bisect it with the cannula, which is continuously injecting visco. Dr. Dr. Anand, you have a technique in which you push the nucleus out through the side port. 
the viscoelastic, they're pushing from inside to outside. Can you just elaborate your technique? Unmute here. Myself? Yes, sir. You you showed some technique. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I am uh, I am using my different technique. You know, I always put fill up the uh, make the new uh, bring the nucleus in the anti chamber after they fill with the viscoelastic. Then I just prepare some clides of the of the uh, of the fine. leaf of uh, IOL papers. You know, small glide. I insert the glide behind the nucleus, and then at the same time, I just keep on slight uh, fill it again the entire chamber with the visco. Then I don't enter with the uh, wire vector inside the entire chamber. I just at the lip, I just press the uh, that glide downwards, and simultaneously with the help of a lens hook, I enter from the side port and push the nucleus from the down to the up. Most of the time, three or half or three fourth of the nucleus, once it comes out, with the help of uh, again with the lens hook from the superior side, you take out the nucleus. So you with uh, my technique, I always find uh, uh, cornea very clear, not damage the because I fill the viscoelastic very. I mean, uh, I mean good amount of viscoelastic inside. I have a question for Doctor Parikshit. This is only if possible if your incision is big. Pardon. This is only possible by pushing from inside if your incision is big. It depends upon the hardness of the nucleus. I don't compromise with that, the size, because I always call it an adequate incision surgery. It is not I mean, minor or major. It is adequate incision cataract surgery. So one right. point of right. is that if, if, if the nucleus is hard, if I'm going to face a hard nucleus, definitely I make my incision slightly away from the limbus, giving the equal amount of astigmatism as the near uh, the new limbus. Uh, one point is very much clear that we have to use liberal amount of uh, viscoelastic during nucleus delivery because this is a very crucial point and the nucleus, if it is hard, it's very near to the endothelium, it can damage the endothelium. Uh, since we are running short of time, let me go to the next topic, the cortical cleanup. Uh, can I request Dr. Ronak Punia to please... Uh, come up with his slides. Dr. Anil Kothari, Dr. Chandel, sir, and Dr. Sumit will be the panelists for this particular talk. Dr. Ronak, please. So am I audible? Yes, now yes. you're audible. You have to speak slightly loud, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon to the galaxy of intellectuals. I, Dr. Ronak Kunia, will be speaking on cortical cleanup. The cortex removal after nucleus delivery and epinucleus removal is a prerequisite for the proper in the bag implantation of the intraocular lens. A satisfactory cortical cleanup ensures a well-centered IOL, clear visual access, superior visual outcome, and less inflammation in the post-operative period, and less chances of posterior capsular opacification, while preserving the capsular bag, sens sensory ligament of the lens, and corneal endothelium. The prerequisite for the co uh, good cortical cleanups are capsular access instead of can opener capsulotomy, a gently performed hydro dissection, a good quality of Simcoe cannula. Now, epinucleus management. In case hydro delineation has been performed and a large epinucleus remains, this can be removed by using either hydro or visco expression. The hydro, in a hydro expression, the flow of irrigating fluid from the anterior chamber maintainer can be used to spontaneously hydro express the epinucleus. A spatula can be used to widen the mouth. Uh, of the incision so that the epinucleus easily comes out. Now the epinucleus can also be expressed by pressure from the viscoelastic as the methyl cellulose is injected in the capsular bag and anterior chamber and the posterior lip of the sclerocolonial tunnel is depressed to facilitate the visco expression of the epinucleus. Now, the cortical matter can, uh, can be aspirated either manually with irrigation aspiration cannula or with automated unimanual or bimanual systems. The advantages of automated irrigation aspiration system are uh, the removal of the cortex in tightly closed AC as AC is deep. The furnaces remain open and easily accessible. No forward movement of the vitreous and posterior capsule and less chance of the choroidal effusion and hemorrhage and less damage to endothelium too. And the disadvantages are it is a difficult pro uh, procedure require proper setting and a sudden surge of the machine control infusion pressure can rupture the posterior capsule. 
Now the manual cortical cleanup is easily mastered technique and has great safety, flexibility, and reliability. The cortical material in the fornix has a very dense and mucoid consistency and needs higher level of aspiration. Now in granular uh, cortical material, the less suction is required and uh, uh, more, deli uh, more delicate uh, pull is used. The most commonly used irrigation aspiration cannula is Simcoe cannula. It comes with uh, different sizes from 21 to 24 gauge, but most commonly 23 gauge is used. It is a, a small caliber twin barrel IA unit, one for aspiration and another for irrigation. Now, aspiration port is situated always anteriorly and the infusion port on the side. Now, this is a Simcoe cannula. It is, very, uh, it is of two types, direct and reverse. Uh, now, it has a layer hub. This is the layer hub. It is meant for irrigation and another hub which is attached to the PVC pipe is aspiration hub. Now, reverse, uh, uh, this is a uh, direct Simcoe. Now, reverse Simcoe is uh, same as the direct, but the hubs are interchanged. Now, uh, this lower hub is uh, meant for the uh, aspiration, and this hub is used for the irrigation in reverse Simcoe. It is important to note that in both uh, type of port, in both these types, the port remains the same. Now, the procedure. The Simcoe, uh, curved Simcoe cannula is gently slipped into the anterior chamber, and the loose cortical material floating in the AC is gently aspirated. Remove as much of cortical material as possible before turning into fine cortical material. The cannula is placed beneath the margin of the anterior capsule, and the cortical material is, is engaged by applying gentle suction. It is pulled and brought into the center of the pupil before finally aspirating it. Now, the occurrence of the posterior capsule sucking into uh, the aspiration tip is minimized by always keeping the aspiration port facing anteriorly. The posterior capsule adherence to tip is immediately identified by the appearance of the fold and stress line on the, uh, in the posterior capsule, which converge uh, toward the aspiration port. If the capsule is not released promptly, it may be torn. The surgeon must stop aspiration immediately and push the syri uh, syringe piston a little to reflux the fluid and release the capsule. Now, there are a few techniques for the aspiration of the subincisional cortex. First is uh, by direct aspiration. In this, the cannula is held vertically to effectively, uh, effectively place the aperture in contact at the 11 o'clock or the side of it. Once the cortex is in engaged, the tip is moved peripherally to strip the cortex and aspirate it. It is a little uh, difficult technique and uh, PC rent can occur in this technique. So uh, the second technique is side port by side port aspiration. The one or two side port incision about 70 to 90 degree apart uh, away from the primary incision are made and aspiration of the subincisional cortex is done by the Simcoe cannula. Now the uh, third technique is by manual aspiration. It is the best method, especially if, the, if an automated system is used as the irrigating and the aspirating hand pieces can be interchanged to allow easy accessibility of the entire cortical matter. Fourth is the aspiration over the eye well. The aspirating cannula is placed vertically, obliquely, vertically or obliquely such that the aspiration port faces posteriorly. The cannula rests on the IOL surface and thus IOL acts as a barrier between the cannula and the posterior capsule. Now, another technique uh, is iris retraction. Iris can be retracted uh, uh, on the 12 o'clock with the help of small iris hook and then exposed cortex is easily aspirated. Now, another technique is uh, stuck and aspiration, uh, split aspiration. While the anterior chamber is filled with viscoelastic, a 1cc syringe attached to a 23 gauge cannula is used to aspirate the subincisional cortex. The syringe sucks the material out of the capsular fornix uh, and the uh, cortical uh, and put the uh, cortical remnant back in the anti center of the anterior chamber for the easy aspiration at the end of the procedure. We can also use uh, U, uh, U or J shaped cannulas. These cannulas are inserted into the incision sideways and these are rotated and then the tip is placed under the anterior capsule to aspirate the superior cortex. And uh, lastly, a gentle massage on the of the iris by irrigation aspiration cannula at the 12 o'clock position can also dislodge the cortex. Now the cortical cleanup in uh, PC rent. <coughs> in case of posterior capsular rupture, it is ideal to convert it into a capsular excess as this prevents the extension of the tear during the rest of the surgery. The technique of dry aspiration under viscoelastic can be employed. And the direction of the aspiration is toward the tear and not away from it, as it may lead to further extension of the tear. If the vitreous is already in the anterior chamber, then a bimanual irrigation aspiration can be done after uh, through anterior vitrectomy. 
Uh, lastly, a few key points. You should never respirate uh, blindly. The most accessible part of the eye is tackled first, such as the inferior three to four o'clock hours. And the one uh, quadrant of the cortex is removed in one attempt. The side port not only helps to reform the anterior chamber at the end of surgery, but also to helps to aspirate the cortex from the sub incision region. You should keep a balance between irrigation and aspiration to avoid collapsing of the anterior chamber. And we should uh, keep, uh, keep an eagle eye on the accidental engagement of the posterior capsule. And lastly, aspiration, aspirating uh, cortex in a, in a shallow chamber is always brought with the complications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ronak. Uh, good talk. The main concern to SICS is here is a 12 o'clock aspiration, the aspiration of the sub-incisional cortex. So let's hear from the uh, panelists. Uh, what are their views on that? How do they perform sub-incisional aspiration of uh, cortex? Dr. Rajinder Chandel, sir, are you here? Yeah, please. Uh, I want to add two points. Please unmute. Arun, I want to add two points in this. Sure, sir. Sure. One thing is, as Ronak nicely pointed out, that IA in shallow chamber is with all the complications. So for beginners, the pressure of the cannula should be should not be on the posterior lip. The pressure should be on the upper lip. It, no, it, sir. it may be, otherwise one has to be neutral. And second point no, I sir. just want to mention, I mentioned that we have to go most accessible parts to start with. I little bit differ and advise according to embryological point of view, there are three sutures, four o'clock, eight o'clock and 12 o'clock. And there are some corticocapsular adhesions. So we have to go to four o'clock, then eight o'clock, and from side port, I usually remove 12 o'clock. If you do all the three points, then the IA will be very fluent. And within no time, rest of the materials can be taken out. So these are the two points. Thank you. Dr. Rajinder, please. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Arun Chatrava. Uh, I want to uh, give some uh, the good tips uh, for removing of the, the most difficult and uh, last part of the cortical matter that is uh, subincisional cataract. So, so for removing of the subincisional cataract, the, 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 this cortical matter is removed with the, either with the side port. It is very easy to remove with the Simco because most of the SICS uh, surgeons are using Simco cannula. Uh, and the best way to uh, remove the subvisional cataract and the 360 approach, 360 approach is uh, by bimanual techniques. But uh, the, the bimanual that uh, the, the instruments are not accessible to everybody. So they use, usually use the side, uh, this uh, Simco cannula. So for Simco cannula, mm. we can uh, go through the side port, very easy to remove the, this uh, subvisional cataract. That is the last part and very difficult uh, while uh, removing this uh, uh, sub incisional cataract, uh, you can um, uh, grab the, this posterior capsule and uh, this can cause uh, this very uh, ripping of the posterior capsule. So to prevent the ripping of the posterior capsule, uh, the, the, there should be a very close monitoring of the posterior capsule because posterior capsule is very thin. Uh, it's uh, almost four micron in thickness. It is uh, half of the RBC. So it is a very thin membrane and it is very uh, fragile. So always uh, keep the watch over the, this posterior capsule and uh, the, the, there, there would be a, uh, this uh, spider-like reflex or uh, radial force. As suddenly we see the radial, the, 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 your, the cannula should not be suddenly withdrawn. Most of residents and many doctors just, uh, just as they grip this, uh, grab this posterior capsule, they suddenly uh, withdraw the cannula and it causes the uh, aspiration and the ripping of the posterior capsule. So never suddenly withdraw your cannula uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, as you see the, this radial force of the posterior capsule and never move your 
this uh, cannula aspirating cannula side to side so that you can uh, release and, and and you can uh, reflux your fluid from the this, this your syringe you are holding in the right hand uh, or left hand and uh, by this you can release the posterior capsule and another technique to uh, dislodge and remove the this sub incisional cataract is uh, the cortex is just uh, put the iol and uh, move it and uh, rotate it so by this the the the, the, the haptics uh, mechanically dislodge this uh, small piece of this uh, cortical matter and uh, after uh, after putting some uh, viscoelastic later on as this uh, dislodged cortical matter can be easily aspirated and third one is this uh, it is i think uh, previously the senior doctors are using j shape cannula the j shape cannula is also very useful to dislodge and uh, flush out this uh, uh, subincisional cataract and uh, uh, easily it can be removed by the uh, uh, dis after dislodging of the this uh, small piece of this subincisional cataract and one more thing i want to add in this the 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 the, the bottle height the bottle height and floor height while uh, removing this subincisional cataract we have to go a little bit uh, deeper and uh, uh, have to uh, indent the uh, this uh, uh, your uh, sideboard so be very good in floor height of the this uh, bss should be good so that we should always protect the ripping of the posterior capsule and uh, uh, one more thing i want to add the 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 the, the, the most of the, the, the tears of ripping of the posterior capsule happens in aspiration irrigation so always keep watch over the uh, grabbing of the posterior capsule and spider reflex and radial force visualization thank you very much very valid points for the beginners very valid points uh, since we are running short of the time so i will not allow any more discussions so i will be moving on to the next topic dr nikita uh, she'll be talking about uh, iul insertion dr uh, ajay kapoor dr sonal kalia and dr himan gupta will be the panelists for this particular talk dr nikita uh, sir am i audible yes, yes. Very good afternoon everyone i am dr nikita jain jr3 from sms medical college jaipur i would first like to thank international society for msics and ros for giving me this opportunity i will talk on iol insertion after the removal of cortical matter the iol can be inserted through the self sealing scleral tunnel by one of the following methods by injecting viscoelastic cohesive device by continuous irrigation using the anterior chamber maintainer or by injecting an air bubble that is the ruits technique this is a video to demonstrate the insertion of pmma uh, rigid iol we first insert a viscoelastic ovd preferably cohesive device inside the capsular bag the pmma lens is then held at the junction of optic and the trailing haptic with the help of a mcpherson's forceps and the leading haptic is introduced inside the capsular bag with its direction towards down uh, towards below the plane of the iris in some cases we can uh, also put a visco coil elastic device in this case to inflate the capsular bag then the trailing haptic is rotated in the clockwise direction and is stuck gently beneath the capsular rexus margin uh, we can also insert uh, the trailing haptic by using a sinski hook in case the iol has a dialing hole the sinski hook can be uh, attached to the dialing hole and can be rotated for 2 to 3 clock hours from 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock position and can be depressed and released below the capsular margin uh, the single piece foldable iol lens can also be injected in the absence of a rigid iol the confirmatory signs of in the back iol include appearance of a stretch line in the center of the posterior capsule smooth rotation of the iol and when the iol is retracted and is left it should come back in its position also the important thing is a uh, good thorough removal of the viscoelastic substance in order to prevent increase iop post op surgery and uh, also to prevent capsular distension syndrome in complicated cases 
like in case of capsular rupture or zonular dehiscence which can occur in case of pseudo exfoliation very commonly uh, we can, there can be two options to put the iol in the same sitting or to put the iol in a different sitting after the inflammation has subsided but in both the cases the power of the lens to be inserted should be corrected accordingly this is a case of posterior capsular rupture now for this case we can have the following options insertion of anterior chamber iol this is inserted in case where the capsular support for placement of intraocular lens posterior to the iris is deficient but in this case the iris should be normal and the chamber should be of a sufficient depth uh this these are the following steps we first perform anterior vitrectomy peripheral iridotomy is also made preferably away from the haptex of the acil a dispersive ovd injection in this case is preferred to prevent iop spike during the surgery with the help of a lens glide or mcpherson's forceps we can facilitate the placement of the iol the angle of the haptic should remain anterior to the iris plane this is a picture of kelman's multiflex acil uh, the uh, alternative is we can also place the sulcus we can also place the iol in the sulcus it can also be done in two ways the lens can entirely be placed in the sulcus or it can be placed with an optic capture that is the haptics are placed in the sulcus and the optic is slightly tucked beneath the capsular excess margin but in this case also anterior vitrectomy is done and cohesive viscoelastic uh, substance can also be added the implantation of sulcus iol is not preferred in the case where the capsular support is grossly deficient then we have the following options iris claw lens and scleral fixated iol the iris claw lens can be placed by making a scleral tunnel sclerocondyle tunnel of 5.5 mm two side ports can be made at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position anterior vitrectomy is done 0.5% pilocarpine is injected to ensure good pupillary constriction the iol can be introduced in the anterior chamber using an iris claw holding forceps one of the haptics is brought behind the iris and is enclaved using either a sinski hook or iris claw enclaving forceps similarly the second haptic is also brought behind the iris and enclaved care should be taken that this sinski hook should be near the peripheral uh, mid periphery of the iris and not near the pupillary margin in order to prevent the formation of cat's eye pupil this is a picture of iris claw lens uh another another uh, lens that can be placed is the scleral fixated iol both three piece foldable or rigid iol can be used uh two commonly used techniques are there it's sutured and sutureless uh in suture technique nano polypropylene uh, suture is commonly used and lewis technique and hoffman's technique are common techniques to be used but nowadays sutureless scleral fixation iol are also uh, being performed uh yamani technique being one of the very common techniques but fibrin glue can also be used to secure the haptics of the suture less scleral fixation iol thank you very much for the patient listening thank you very much dr nikita uh, can i request the panelists dr sonal kalia dr ajay kapoor and uh, dr sonal kalia your comments please Very well presented, Dr. Nikita. Uh, thank, thank you so much for being in time. Uh, would you uh, would you care to uh, share with the uh, people uh, who are young of Sharma Mohan that what kind of an IOL power adjustment should be done in the various options that you have discussed? Uh, for ma'am, uh, anterior chamber IOL, uh, it is usually two to point two point five to three diopters, so power is uh, re reduced. For iris claw, one point five to two diopters can be reduced, and for uh, SFIOL, point uh, seven five to one diopter uh, is generally reduced. Doctor Nikita, you are talking about anterior iris claw implants or posterior iris claw implants? So for posterior, retropupillary iris claw. Retrofixation of the iris yes. claw. Yes. Yes. Sir. Doctor Ravindran uh, is a master in this, and I have learned this technique from him. Uh, can you elaborate more, sir, Dr. Ravindra? Okay, basically, it depends upon the constant of the lens, and as Dr. Zahu said, uh, it's very relevant. Most of the uh, iris claw lens they mentioned the anterior uh, iris claw uh, fixation. Uh, 
a constant so that's not correct so i would uh, i think uh, what dr jain said is uh, please talk loudly ravindra please okay uh, you are not talking to yourself we have to listen <laughs> so the uh, imagine you have selected a lens of 20.5 for a posterior chamber implantation 118.7 is the a constant it will be about quarter to half that or lesser if it is in the sulcus not more than that ultimately it is how much of angulation you will have to check optic haptic angulation some of them have angulation some of them are plano haptic plano haptic if it is plano haptic it is half that you can take it ac is about one that 1 to 1.5 117 is the a constant so it's about as you said two adapters uh one minute but one to 1.5 adapters lesser than your pc lens so uh, two to three adapters will be too much okay. and uh, go by the uh, a constant and the ones you have a constant that may not uh, see post graduates always should analyze what they're doing everything you have to keep it in record your care readings you have to keep it in record pre and post op and what is your target what is the a constant what did you achieve if you make your own study you will get much better uh, information not only about target hematopia but also the astigmatism you go to you, you go to target so this is every case when you have a register when you are maintaining a register maintain what is the coverage of the cornea before and coverage of the cornea afterwards many people say post op i got half the astigmatism half the after of astigmatism at 180 and the patient had half the after of astigmatism in 90 it is not zero it is one after of sia similarly if you have a target hematopia you are uh, planning to achieve is zero if you have achieved half the after you should not keep quiet go and find out why you have erred on half the after side there may be other reasons unless you have this discipline of uh, documenting what results you have you will not improve thank you sir thank you wakalat uh, number 13 the end to this to phir bhi par aagle par aur bhi karte hain ya ya to phir bilkul hi mat karo wakalat number normally can you just switch off your mic uh, there's some disturbance coming from your mic uh, dr ravi trehan sir any tips on insertion of iul you know tera san kaati hai koi hello Eight minutes, eight minutes. Enough tips are already given, but one thing is just I would like to say that foldable lens implantation is not covered properly. And uh, I just want to ask, rather than giving any tips from Ravindra sir, I am facing always little problem, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Is there any difference if we put the hydrophobic foldable lens? because i'm always feeling a little bit problem uh, hydrophilic i'm always the comfortable no hydrophobic is very easy sir only thing is uh, how you are implanting if you have a 6 mm you coat with viscoelastic never try to push it, it when it is, it is with injector only most of the incisions are 4 mm i am having oh man then you like to have an injector you yeah, have yes. an injector. i'm i'm putting with injector only excellent sir you uh, what i do is uh, if that is the injector oh, If that is my cartridge i fill the cartridge with viscoelastic yes. hold the lens i don't hold the center of the lens because center of the lens optically has to remain no, hold. hold the lens only in the periphery first pass the entire lens into the cartridge and coat it with viscoelastic or you put it from outside once it coat with viscoelastic the position of haptics will not stuck to each other yes yes stuck. so after that you take out the lens then as you are inserting now the rest of it i don't have to tell there are a lot of videos the one haptic has to uh, fold other haptic has to fold then push it inside it's as good as you are doing on a uh, fake emulsification it's much easier because there is no uh, resistance always go for a larger like if you are taking an alcon go for an a cartridge or a b cartridge don't try c and d cartridge which will shrink and which will which will distort the lens too much and so i always has on optic should haptic be put on optic yeah in hydrophobic you have to fold it you have to fold it and the plunger has to touch the edge of the optic and push it you should not go in front of the optic if it goes in front of the optic you have a tear you see how it's pushing that is the plunger you should 
abut the edge of the optic and then push it. And haptic should not be involved in the uh, pushing. Haptic is folded. Both the haptics are folded. You did not. I I, I I don't think the leading haptic has to be folded. Oh, both have to be folded, sir. Otherwise, uh, lens lens may go upside down. So lens has yeah. to be folded that way. Lens has to be folded that way. If if it goes the other way around, then plunger will not uh, push the lens. Plunger will go under the lens. So I think both the haptics has to be folded. Both the haptics has to be folded. Most most of the time, most of the time, the problem occurs that in hydrophobic lenses, if you don't weight the lenses properly. If you uh, weight the lens properly with the saline and then put it viscoelastic, it goes smoothly and it uh, the haptic uh, doesn't uh, stick on the optic part. But sometimes, most of the time, uh, it becomes very difficult sometimes to separate it from uh, optic. And so it's better to coat it with viscoelastic. Very... Better to coat with viscoelastic rather than saline. Saline, this is a hydrophobic. Yes, saline will not fit. It'll run away. There is the one more thing I want to add. The, I used to use the practice. Yeah, there, there's the breaking of the haptics is very common with the uh, this uh, injector injectors. So to prevent it, I used to uh, load the this uh, IOL in the cartridges underneath the microscope. Yes. I usually load them my, all the my my uh, lenses underneath the microscope under the low magnification so that we cannot override this. Uh, uh, plunger over the haptics. So it is a very common uh, reason that overriding of the, this plunger, this uh, ripping of the posterior capsule occurs. That's uh, ripping of the haptic occurs. This so is the, really nice, nice point, but I just want to add, after locking this plunger, we have to yes, push sir, yes, sir, yes. plunger little yes, bit yes, yeah, and then yeah, retract yes, it yes, back. Yes. Yes, retract it, retract it back and yes, yes. push up to the narrowest part, narrowest part of the cartridge. As you reach the narrowest part of the cartridge, just retract the plunger and see whether it is crushing over, riding over the haptic or not. Then go uh, go ahead. The, 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 you will never break your haptic as you follow this uh, loading underneath the microscope and retracting as you reaches up to the narrowest part of the cartridge. It, this practice is very safe and very good for uh, preventing the uh, breaking of the haptics. Yes, sir. Thanks. Sir, as, as a routine, I <clears throat> I slit the cartridge. Like you, yes. that's a cartridge. Take a knife and slit it on the top for about four five millimeters. So the narrow cartridge is not there anymore. See, in ours, it's that's a luxury that we have in SICS. We don't have to push it through a small cartridge. Just slit on the top. Just make it a four five mm slit on the top. So now this will open up as the lens is going through it. And the point is very, very right. In the beginning itself, see where the plunger is going. If it is trying to go over the lens or under the lens, try to take it out, remove the lens and re-implant it, re-load re the haptic. So if now, load it, it under the microscope, yeah. that is one good yeah, point. Loading under right. the microscope is very safe, sir. Very good, good, good practice it is. And you can see the, the, the lens, how it is folding and how it is leading and going in the, the uh, this uh, tra traveling inside your cartridge. You can see directly under the microscope okay. under 4x four, 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 four or 6x. Okay. It is very safe practice, sir. What do, what do you do, Dr. Where you put the incision? In the tip part or the upper part? Uh, on the dorsal part of the cartridge. Yeah, from the tip, I said, if that is my uh, cartridge, from the tip of the, lid, bevel, lid, the tip of the bevel, I cut it like that. Yeah, on the tip of the bevel, the top, only the top okay. portion. Okay. Okay, I That's think uh, very, very, a, very very easy. We had a very very nice discussion on the basics. I'm sure most of the PG students who joined us must have benefited uh, by this uh, webinar. We almost touched 2,000 uh, delegates uh, during our uh, webinar. Yes, Dr. Dhaliwal, you want to make a point before we close down? Yes. I, I want to make, in just half a minute, I want to make five points which are covering all this. And I'm addressing only the residents now, none of the consultants. Yes. Uh, to stabilize the eye before, nobody has talked about a cotton bud. I've been using just a cotton bud throughout. Yes. Very rarely I, I was holding it and never hold the upper lip of the tunnel, one thing. The second is, as you go 
into the tunnel we have dissected the sclera and we are entering the corneal zone just press the press the heel heel of the crescent and you get the right plane and the third is which uh, i think uh, i haven't seen anybody practice that a nucleus tumbling technique to bring out the nucleus into the anterior chamber nucleus tumbling technique i i can see your forehead going this way arun uh, just see a couple of videos on our i infirmary nabha channel and uh, i would request all the residents to just to google it nucleus tumbling technique and they'll direct you to my channel and uh, the next point is visco expression while we are visco expressing the nucleus we don't have to keep the injecting visco cannula in the chamber fill up the chamber tightly and just press the tunnel the posterior lip of the tunnel and the nucleus engages and you don't have to inject more engages and comes out suppose it engages and is not coming out go from the side port inject more and again press the lower lip the one that uh, i don't remember who was talking about that dr boramani always does that in um, blumenthal's technique when the nucleus has uh, engaged he goes through the side port and presses the nucleus out and uh, this is a little nostalgic for me vikram started calling it the endo expression Bor boramani's endo expression technique and the last point that i would like to uh, make is about the foldable foldable iuls well we are so lucky in sics we don't have to fold even the foldable iuls just put them straight in and a foldable iul when it is folded upon itself it takes many days for that line to disappear in the middle and it might not be any problem for the patient but for the surgeon to be seeing that line for a couple of days under the slit lamp is terrible foldable Thank you. the best inserted unfoldable great Un uh, Dr. Ranjit, sir <laughs> this is a, a, another facility that sics provides us yes, charm sir. of sics i would say yes sir i think before we sum up everything i would like uh, dr op vadwa sir to please uh, thank everybody for this webinar dr op vadwa sir yes on behalf of the international society of msics i thankful to all the presenter and all the delegates and all the viewers especially i am thankful to dr amulya sahu dr Uh, ms ravindra dr ranjit singh dalliwal and others thank you thank you everyone thanks a special thank arun ne, arun in one word techniques would come techniques would go but sis sics has to stay forever that's a good point <laughs> it, it was there before the feco came in it will be there after the feco will leave so yes. is, uh, i'll i'll, I'll add a little i'll i'll add a one sentence here everybody knows the spellings of physics physics is the mother of all science p h y s i c s yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> and a special word of appreciation for dr arun for a wonderful really? moderation of this session yeah arun you did a good job he conducted it very nicely thank you <laughs> thank you arun thank you you thank did you. a wonderful thank job and thank you all you, ravi bye bye to everybody bye -bye. i had support of everybody bye -bye. Bye -bye. thank you and bye bye Thank bye you very much.